on behalf of all that my co-chair has already uh, mentioned, but on behalf of the entire uh, conference chair and the entire organizing committee, I extend a very warm welcome to all of you to the seventh Ecological and Environmental Chemistry 2022. And as mentioned, Speedy, that we are meeting uh, online instead of being person. Uh, but again, I'm delighted to e meet all of you <clears throat> as we spend a couple of days here in this online format to share our knowledge, exchange ideas, and promote the fundamental concept of ecological and environmental chemistry. Uh, so today we have the plenary session, and tomorrow we have five uh, parallel sessions going from fundamental aspects of ecological and environmental chemistry, uh, water science and society, <clears throat> climate change and atmospheric chemistry, food, soil, and waste chemistry, <clears throat> ecological and environmental chemistry with knowledge triangle. And then there are two uh, research education innovation uh, sessions, one in English and the other is in Romanian. Uh, from a historical perspective, again, some parts I'm repeating what my co-chair had mentioned that the conceptual development of this conference was established uh, in late 70s, early 80s of 1900s. Uh, so the first international ecological chemistry uh, school was held in Moldova in 1985, where the decision was taken <clears throat> to consolidate the effort for the organization of periodic international conferences in the field uh, with the involvement of experienced uh, researcher and also young researchers worldwide. Since then, this field has been rapidly expanding and is among the uh, topical priorities of sustainable development in science and technology. Uh, since then, uh, the, this conference is part of a series of very successful conferences organized in 1995, 2002, 2005, 2008, 12, and 2017, and definitely it's supported by several international organizations. Uh, this year, we have close to about 270, 300 scientists from different countries, 30 different countries. Uh, those who are participating, so glad to see that uh, we have such a large participation for this particular conference. And, you know, as Co-Chair mentioned that, of course, we based on what we learn, what we jointly decide, uh, <clears throat> we need to develop path forward uh, so as to enhance this particular field. So with this as a brief introduction, why I once again extend a warm welcome to all of you and hope that we have a great meeting. Uh, and also I would like to uh, wish my dear colleague, uh, Professor Duca, happy birthday. Actually, his birthday is on a very unique day, as you know, 29th of February. Uh, so, <laughs> but of course, we are celebrating a little bit later. He is a great colleague, friend, co-editor, educator, collaborator, and a wonderful person. So uh, I, I wish him all the good luck, many more happy birthdays to celebrate uh, Professor Duca. And I also want to introduce a book which actually should be out perhaps today uh, or tomorrow. <clears throat> this is a handbook of research on water science and society. And there are two volumes. Uh, and this is co-edited by myself, Professor Duca, and Professor Sergei Trevin. Uh, as mentioned, the proposed release date is sometime today or tomorrow. It should be out by already now, I, I don't know, but uh, nonetheless, uh, it it's, uh, appears to be a good book. Uh, and I know that we have a session on water science and society. So based on that, perhaps, we could expand on this volume further uh, in the subsequent volumes. From 2017 uh, conference, uh, we uh, collected those papers, added a few more papers to that, and uh, uh, edited a book on handbook of research on emerging developments in environmental impact and ecological chemistry, which was edited by myself and Professor Duca again. 
So with that, let me close my brief remarks and I'm going to, um, uh, from the audience, uh, uh, if uh, someone has a few statements to make uh, about Professor Duke or celebrating his anniversary, uh, we would welcome that uh, and, and comments from the audience. Thank you. Twenty-five years ago, United States shocked the world with a revolutionary discovery. The researchers used hydrogen peroxide as the treatment of the brain diseases. And this discovery was not accidental. Already near 20, uh, 200, pardon, 200 years ago, an Indian doctor used the intravenous hydrogen peroxide solution to treat soldiers with pneumonia and the famous British doctor Benjamin Richardson and the French doctor Louis Pasteur used hydrogen peroxide in medical treatment and sterilization and in disinfection. Very interesting is the fact that 70, 80 years ago, when it was necessary to launch uh, satellites into the cosmic space where there is no oxygen to burn the fuel, the concentrated hydrogen peroxide used to generate oxygen to combustion. Hydrogen peroxide is a discovery in 1818 by the French chemist Jacques Louis Tenard in, in a very simple reaction between peroxide of barium and nitric acid. In, 18, in 1846, the property of hydrogen peroxide was established. And in 1873, the first industrial synthesis was, was, was carried out. After that, over the years, there, there was a very rich history of hydrogen peroxide research and production. I suppose that a certain part of uh, this history belongs to the uh, comprehensive studies on hydrogen peroxide conducted in Moldova since 1960s uh, in the Department of Physical Chemistry of the Moldova State University in collaboration with the Institute of Chemical Physics of the Russian <coughs> Academy. I was uh, very lucky to meet the personality who uh, played the important role and make uh, my professional achievements as a chemist and as a personality. I, want, I would like to uh, mention uh, Alexei, Professor Alexei Sichov, Isaac Bersukir, Viktor Isak, Dmitry Batir, Viktor Kovalev from Moldova, Antony Purma, Yuri Skurlato, Vladimir Komic, Sergei Travin, Elena Stam from Russia, Yunel Haiduk, Ioana Aurel Pop, Florin Filip, Matei Makogano, Viktor Spinei, Marius Androv, Igor Krecesco, Vasily Burlui, Maria Zeferescu, Gabriela Nemes from Romania, Seymour Van Gandhi, Joseph Malina, Tom Owens, Ashok Basiasta from USA, Aurelio Miziti, Antonino Zichichi, Maria Rosaria Bori, Pedro Cavazzini from Italy, uh, Andrew Beniston, Sally Levesley from UK, Janusz Lipkowski, Bogusław Buzewski from Poland, Mufid Bahadir, Günther Stock, Fritz Freeman from Germany, Ali Mamidovich Yenan, Tatiana Rakiska, Rodislav Goncharuk, Sergei Piroshkov from Ukraine, Werner Stum, Antonio, Lop Antonio Loprieno from Switzerland, As Asab Hajiyev, Ibrahim Guliyev from Azerbaijan, Momir Jurovic from Montenegro, Alma Gassayevna Samurzina, Murat Jurinov, Selig Burkin Bayer from Kazakhstan, Gevor Purumian, Radik Martirosian from Armenia, uh, 
and uh, uh, Zhu Bing Xiu, Professor Zhu Bing Xiu from China. I will start my presentation with the structure and properties which are very important to understand the reaction distribution and function uh, that hydrogen peroxide performs. Uh, cl uh, classically, the hydrogen peroxide molecule is a gas uh, or solid, has a spatial structure. Both oxygen atoms have long electron pairs, which uh, imply the high reactivity of this uh, molecule. The molecule of hydrogen peroxide can be regarded as a water molecule uh, with the additional oxygen uh, atom attached to the rest of, of uh, it uh, with uh, hydrogen bonds. Due to these bonds, like uh, in water, uh, the liquid hydrogen peroxide molecules are arranged in the groups as cluster. Hydrogen peroxide is very reactive. For example, the energy of the O bond in the hydrogen peroxide, uh, peroxide molecule is a 138 kilojoule. And this is a very similar to the energy of the NN bond and hydrazine molecule, which uh, is uh, quite reactive. And uh, uh, due to the hydrogen bonds, hydrogen peroxide is as liquid as water and viscose. It, mix, it mixes uh, with the water in uh, any proportion. It is uh, soluble in either and uh, alcohol. The most properties of hydrogen peroxide are quite similar to water. Uh, this, this, thus, uh, it has a high dielectric constant, uh, 73, uh, close to water, 80, being a good uh, ionizing uh, solvent. Hydrogen, hydrogen peroxide is uh, uh, oxidant and reducer. Hydrogen peroxide is a weak acid and uh, therefore dissociates. But in the acidic environment, hydrogen peroxide has oxidizing properties for the radicals. In the basic environment, hydrogen peroxide manifests itself as a reducing agent forming molecule of oxygen. Uh, it's very interesting. It's very interesting. Hydrogen peroxide could be called an allotropic compound of water, light, ozone, and oxygen. An important part of uh, the history of research of hydrogen peroxide has been devoted devoted uh, to the study of the reaction mechanisms. British chemist Fenton was the first scientist who established the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide involving ions, uh, iron ions as a reducing and catalytic agent. Reaction 5 and 8 were discovered by Hubbard and Weiss. Therefore, this system is known as Fenton Hubbard and Weiss system. In this system, free radicals uh, of species of hydrogen peroxide are formed. In recent years, several ways of free radicals formation in natural water uh, discovered, which uh, you can see in this slide. Some of these uh, pathways have been uh, identified in our research, especially in water environment. Hydrogen peroxide and free radicals are intermediate compounds in water and oxygen cycle, in which water oxidation and oxygen reducing occur. Thus, during the photosynthesis, loss of a chain of four electrons proceeds. In natural water, more often are met the processes with the one of two electrons transfer. In uh, all these cases, the intermediate particles, uh, particles uh, are formed, including free radicals and hydrogen peroxide. The effect of Fenton's reaction is very relevant in the uh, defensive mechanism of uh, many living organisms. How does this defensive mechanism function to you? 
For example, a Bombardier B2. Inside the abdomen, there are two individual chambers, each the filled with the different substance. When mixed, they provoke the explosion. And this chamber is loaded with the hydroquinone. The other chamber contains hydrogen peroxide. They are accompanied by an enzyme. The mixture releases a lot of heat, a lot of oxygen, and the hydroxyl radicals. This happens when the beetle feels a danger and the reaction products are ejected towards the enemy. But let's get back to the reaction mechanisms. The cycle mechanism of uh, reactions with Fenton system involve involvement was demonstrated with the addition of uh, tartaric acid. I studied in my doctoral thesis uh, this process in detail and developed the mechanism of the reaction, which uh, revealed the formation of the hydroxyfumaric acid during the uh, slow oxidation followed the cycle mechanism. Uh, there is a lot of talk about uh, dehydroxyfumaric acid today because it's a, a powerful antioxidant and maintains the quality of wine and food. Some researchers believe that uh, this acid uh, played an important role in the prebiotic uh, period in uh, supramolecular chemistry. This mechanism has been confirmed by the use of the rate constant of free radicals recombination and their interaction with the different substances. Uh, the highest reactive of, uh, uh, of OH radicals was detected. Electron transfer from one atom to another is a fundamental uh, in, underlines the various chemical reactions, such as the redox process and the photosynthesis. Rudolf Marcus, uh, an American uh, Nobel laureate, have developed the theory of charge transfer due to the asymmetric distribution of electrons in the chemical bonds. By the way, the pseudo Jan Teller effect determining the structure of molecule for the first time was uh, revealed by the scientists from a uh, uh, team uh, from uh, Institute of Chemistry conducted uh, by Isaac uh, Bersuke. In addition to Marcus theory, our experiments have revealed the, that hydrogen peroxide can form with metal ions the partial charge transfer complexes which exhibited the some, sometimes oxidizing and reducing properties. The most favorable condition for this complex formation are achieved uh, when the degree to charge transfer alpha is uh, close to 0 uh, 0.5, as in the case of covalent bond uh, of hydrogen peroxide. Depending uh, on the redox characteristic of metal, mono or B electron transfer is possible. In case of monodentate bond, mononuclear superoxide complex will be formed uh, with the redox potential 0.12 electron volt. In case of B dentate bond, B nuclear peroxide complex type is formed with the redox potential 0.12. 44 uh, electron volt. Complexes with the partial charge transfer can appear in many chemical systems during the homogeneous catalysis, photochemical processes, biological system during the development of chemical, bio chemical biological processes in living organisms, technological systems during the post water treatment and other. The mechanism of such processes play significant role in quality assurance of natural water, food production, uh, beverage uh, production, including production of wine, juice, and other. 
for a long time, hydrogen peroxide uh, was uh, used as a reagent for investigation of the redox uh, process mechanisms. However, since the uh, uh, 1940s, uh, data on this spread, uh, spread in the different uh, medium began uh, to appear. International research team from Sweden has had the discovered hydrogen peroxide molecules in our galaxy, galaxy at approximately 400 light years distance. In the last year, hydrogen peroxide was discovered on the planet Mars. Hydrogen peroxide was detected in glaciers of Greenland and Antarctica. It was found that the concentration of hydrogen peroxide is higher than the older glaciers, which means that now water is more and more polluted. In a very small concentrations, hydrogen peroxide is present in water, animal products, uh, fresh fruits and vegetables, and the human body, uh, including cells, digestive tract, blood, uh, lymph, and uh, lungs. Under normal living organism, hydrogen peroxide is an important component Anab an anabolic and catabolic reactions, helping to maintain the homeostasis of cells. Usually, hydrogen peroxide is formed in peroxisomes. In larger uh, amounts, it is uh, formed in liver as a result of different types of stress. During the evolution, uh, living organisms have formed the ability to respond to the action of exogenous stressors by forming the reactive oxygen species, such as hydrogen peroxide, uh, hydroxide radical, anion radical. Chemical reaction related to oxidative stress is given below. Increasing hydrogen peroxide and the reactive oxygen species concentration contribute to signal perception and transduction. Activation of transcription and expression of uh, uh, resistance genes. Synthesis of shock proteins, uh, which protect the cellular enzyme system against oxidative process. Localization of the infection by the death uh, of the uh, uh, infected cells. The principal sources of hydrogen peroxide, uh, uh, hydrogen peroxide in the atmosphere is ultraviolet, ozone, and free radicals. The estimated total amount of hydrogen peroxide in the atmosphere is about two megatons. Hydrogen peroxide is mainly found in the troposphere up to the high to uh, 13 uh, kilometers. It is found in water, drops, clouds, fog, and rain. This, this precipitation contributes to the accumulation of hydrogen peroxide in soil. So the, uh, so the annual rainfall of hydrogen peroxide in the soil is around 200 gram per square meter. And the atmosphere uh, is polluted, which uh, if, sorry, if the atmosphere is polluted with the sulfur dioxide, when uh, ketosulfide predominates to atmosphere precipitation. This type of precipitation contributes to the formation as a reducing state of soil and uh, respectively accelerates the denitrification processes, which lead to the loss of nitrogen from soil. This provokes the soil erosion. Thus, uh, over uh, uh, the years, it was uh, been shown that hydrogen peroxide is uh, uh, widespread in nature. Studies uh, on hydrogen peroxide in the hydrosphere are extremely important, uh, especially uh, consider considering that life itself appeared in water when the atmosphere was in the reducing state. 
In uh, 1963, uh, uh, Van Balen and Marlen from Danish and USA discovered hydrogen peroxide in the uh, Gulf of Mexico. In 1983, uh, Russian uh, scientists Korlato and Sinenikov uh, discovered uh, hydrogen peroxide in the River Volga. In 1986, uh, Dr. Roman Chunk and me discovered uh, uh, the hydrogen peroxide in the River Pru. In 2000, uh, the team from State University, uh, conducted by Dr. Glatki, discovered uh, the hydrogen peroxide in the River Nistro and lakes Beleo and Giri and Girigigi. Uh, measurements of hydrogen per peroxide uh, by US uh, researchers in Atlantic and Pacific Ocean uh, after rain uh, showed that hydrogen peroxide content on the ocean surface rise sharply 10 about 100 times. But after a few hours, hydrogen peroxide content reached a stationary level. This phenomenon shows that hydrogen uh, peroxide is contained in rain water. In our research, it was found that hydrogen peroxide contents is increased in natural water during the daytime due to the photochemical processes and is decreased, decreased in the night. These results were confirmed in 2020 by the Japanese uh, uh, researchers. Look uh, uh, at the similarities uh, sim of the fig figures made by the Japanese after 38 years. Uh, these examples demonstrate the oscillation of hydrogen peroxide content in the environment due to the different chemical and photochemical processes. The most efficient mechanism of oxygen and hydrogen peroxide activation are those with the involvement of uh, coordination compounds. The research results on kinetics and the mechanisms of some redox reactions uh, with the participation of hydrogen peroxide have shown that the most important pathways of hydrogen peroxide formation and decomposition in natural waters uh, a photochemical process, a catalytical process, and the presence of uh, transition metal ions and complexes, and biocatalytical process. The catalytic uh, redox processes in natural waters can occur following the several mechanisms, including the cyclic mechanism, activation mechanism, or radical chain mechanism. Based on this mechanism, we propose the mathematical formula for the role of hydrogen peroxide formation, which is a function of both biotic and abiotic contribution. The rate of hydrogen peroxide formation in natural waters is a function of the biotic and abiotic contribution and can represent of this mathematical formula. Thus, generalizing the obtained results, we can conclude that the main sources of hydrogen peroxide in the hydrosphere are atmospheric precipitation, photochemical process, and metabolic uh, and metabolites of aquatic uh, organisms. An important step uh, in our research was the analysis of hydrogen peroxide in self purification processes. In natural waters, Biotic and abiotic processes of formation and transformation of oxidative and reducing equivalence take place permanently, as well as the penetration of substances outside the water system. The results of inter interactions between these com components, the redox state is determined by the ratio between the flow rate of oxidative equivalents, hydrogen peroxide, and the flow rate of reducing agents, reducing agents. On the basis of chemical biological approach, the model of natural water cell purification was elaborated. 
Uh, this model includes mathematical formula for calculating the content of different substances during the chemical self purification process with the, the involvement of hydrogen peroxide and free radical. Chemical self purification of water involves the series of metal ion catalyzed redox transformation accompanied with the formation of partial charge uh, transfer compounds as intermediates. As a result of the pollutant uh, decomposition of water due to the, this reaction, the natural ecological balance is established. Based on the models developed and the mechanism of redox processes in water environment, a new notion uh, of uh, has uh, been proposed, biological value of the environment which represent the chemical composition of the environment suitable for favorable growth and development of living organisms. This notion reflects the vision and mission of ecological chemistry as a science and is found in all our research works, as well as the textbooks and monographs dedicated in this field. Also, from the from this, uh, from our, from this research, two quality indicators uh, of the aquatic environment were, uh, were proposed. First, redox toxicity, and second, inhibiting capacity. We have come to the conclusion uh, that the redox catalytic process in natural waters can be schematically represented as a chemical reactor. The redox substances penetrate in such micro reactor from atmosphere, water and bottom de deposits, which serve the sources of oxidative or reductive species. Independence uh, on the presence of these species, water can be in the reductive or oxidative states, which can uh, uh, affect the development of living organisms and eat. The role of hydrogen peroxide in natural water, namely maintenance of biologic value of habitation, was demonstrated by the large scale toxicologic test. And uh, I will describe here two of the, uh, these tests, which uh, had uh, uh, practical applications. The first example referred to the research conducted by Professor Spurlato together with a colleague from Moldavian State University on the Volga River. It was discovered the death of a Sugrian fish fry when the hydrochemical indicators of water were within the norm. The toxic factor that has been identified was the lack uh, lack of hydrogen peroxide. The monitoring of the redox state of water during the seasonal partial demonstrate that first, in oxidizing, in oxi, in oxidizing me, uh, medium, when hydrogen peroxide is present in water, the uh, survival of fish was close to 100%. Second, in stable redox period, when hydrogen peroxide uh, occurs during the day and is absent in the morning, the amount of uh, young fish is low. And the last, in the reducing condition, when hydrogen peroxide cannot be found even during the day, small fish fry will die. The second example uh, refers to the uh, worst water treatment which, uh, with the uh, active slides. It was observed that the reducing state was formed when hydrogen peroxide was missing in the treatment of the system. As a result, the active sludge index increases in the sludge uh, uh, falls field uh, uh, yield with the filament doses uh, uh, is rise to the surface uh, getting inactivated. We uh, managed uh, to solve uh, this problem by adding hydrogen peroxide or uh, irradiating the active sludge with the ultraviolet lamp 
uh, that generates free radicals and new amounts of hydrogen peroxide. These results were used for the elaboration of, uh, uh, of a patent uh, concerning the application of ultraviolet radiation for the sludge treatment. Uh, inhibitory capacity is determined by the interaction of uh, OH radicals with pollutants, uh, which became to radical traps. Uh, the effective constant of uh, the interaction can be represented in uh, this slide, where uh, a Ki uh, constant of hydrogen uh, of uh, OH radicals interaction with the traps of the traps. And uh, this is a parameter uh, that characterizes the ability to inhibit the self purification process with the involvement of the OH radicals. The indicator character, characterizes, characterizes only the organic substances uh, that uh, participate in the radical self purification of water. According to this, the inhibit inhibition capacity criterion, the water quality can be clean water, moderated polluted water, and polluted water. Thus, the inhibitory capacity indicator can be used to access the water pollution in correlation with the radical process inhibitors. Based on the, our research data uh, and information from literature, uh, we found that uh, hydrogen peroxide participates in a modulator in maintaining the redox cell homeostasis and thus is involved in the, regulating the, the growth and the uh, ont uh, ontogenetic development of plants. Uh, accordingly, hydrogen peroxide was proposed for using in agriculture. Our team has elaborated the efficient uh, plant growth simulator on its base. Cheria. It is now that the quality of food is uh, deteriorated under the influence of hydrogen peroxide and the free radicals, which uh, promote the uh, condensation of polyphenols. Our research has shown that dehydroxyphoric acid antioxidant effectively inhibits the, con the condensation uh, by uh, trapping the radicals of the uh, polyphenolic regeneration following the cyclic mechanism. This uh, results obtained in common uh, uh, with uh, Maria Gonza, Professor Maria Gonza, and Professor uh, Rudika Sturza, and have served for elaboration of a patent in the field of the food protection, protection technology. At the end of this presentation, I would like to mention that in this report, I have selected and uh, reviewed only some of the studies conducted over uh, 50 years, namely those focused on the role and importance of hydrogen peroxide in the environment, technology, and life. In the research activity, I uh, enjoyed the help and the good understanding for many colleagues and PhD students who are uh, with uh, me today. Uh, I would like to express my gratitude to all of them for the beautiful collaboration and uh, I have had over uh, the, uh, uh, the years. But most of all, I want to thank my wife, academician professor Maria Duca, who has um, with me uh, 30, uh, 30 years, years and uh, for uh, better and worse uh, participated in heated discussions uh, and in all my achievements. Thank for my children and especially the grandchildren who were very kind, good and loving. Thank you for your kind attention. All right, so as mentioned, the topic of the presentation today is biodiverse plastic for environment sustainability and reduction of micro nanoplastic and aquatic ecosystems. So in the context of ecology, I think the context of microplastic is very important. Uh, so I just want to show 
by way of this presentation, uh, our motivation uh, to study this topic. It's environmental impact. Uh, then I would like to introduce a experiment which we conduct using electrospinning. Uh, we use this apparatus for different types of making of sensors, uh, force protection devices, and so forth. We are also integrating electrospinning with the 3D, 4D printing for advanced, manu advanced manufacturing platform. Uh, and I want to also introduce e-textile, some of the earlier experiment we did. And we use a chemical polyvinyl, polyvinyl fluoride, which is a uh, piezoelectric, and we use that for uh, generating electricity. Uh, so as you see from this application, the use of plastic is increasing, but at the same time, it has a very large environmental impact. So by way of this presentation, I would like to show how we can still continue to use the plastic uh, at the same time, reduce the environmental impact. Uh, so that being the motivation, uh, this is a slide which I had introduced roughly about 30 years ago, uh, where we were looking for 10 global priorities which are common to all. And interestingly enough, all these priorities which you see on the left, going from energy to water, food, environment, poverty, terrorism, disease, education, democracy, population, they still continue to dominate. As a matter of fact, we have certain groups which continue to take a survey. And based on this survey, we continue to develop vertical and horizontal priorities and make this recommendation to the federal government. And plastic in, comes as an opportunity while the microplastic appears in those surveys as a challenge. And I'll show you by way of some of these slides. And it was interesting to note that although the 10 priorities which I have shown, UNDP uh, created uh, 15 uh, priorities in 1996, and currently there are 22. Water and the environment pollution uh, continue to dominate those priorities. I also contribute to the future research methodology uh, where we continue to look at different ways how to uh, clean the water, how to reduce the pollution, and uh, obviously have more equity towards the population. So here is some statistics. Uh, as uh, you see, this was all done in 2021. The uh, plastic production continues to increase. In 2021, this was close to about a little over 400 million tons per year. This is also consistent with this slide and the global production of plastic. As you could see from all these slides that the global production of plastics continue to increase. And if you see the global plastic market share by application, packaging by far dominates the use of plastic. Uh, so obviously uh, we need to see how we could uh, work on that so that there is a uh, reduction of uh, plastic in the environment, uh, you know, the plastic which is used for packaging types of application. But nonetheless, other applications being construction, electrical and electronics, automotive, medical application, agriculture, and so forth. Uh, but nonetheless, these advanced and adaptable engineering materials, they play a key role in structural automobile, packaging, healthcare, textile, electronics, and defense and commodity types of applications. Although we have uh, increased recycling, so on the left shows the recycling uh, path of the plastic, and on the right, it shows the plastic which is not recycled, but actually is uh, turned into energy by way of burning, but even despite of these two uh, methods which are in use to recycle or convert the plastic, uh, this slide shows the microplastic 
uh, sorry, plastic, which ends up into the environment. And as you could see, a larger share of this plastic uh, goes to the landfill and a large number of that ends up actually in the water into the oceans. Uh, but then there are uh, different other statistics which you could see only a small portion is used for combustion uh, and substantially a smaller uh, portion as you see is used for recycling. So the one which actually goes to the landfill uh, is the one which creates a challenge and I'm going to show you by the following slides. Uh, these are some of the pictures. I have thousands of pictures showing the plastic that floats into the ocean. This is from a Tijuana, uh, Mexico. Uh, you could see river full of plastic bottles and so forth. Uh, this is also used for burning, but nonetheless, it obviously produces the greenhouse emission gases. Uh, so obviously it continues to uh, increase, uh, produce more and more pollution, environmental pollution. But the plastic which goes either into the water or in air, there are two types of plastics which we see. One is the primary. These are the one which enter the marine environment or the atmospheric environment into micro size. And then the second one being the secondary microplastics. And as you could see, they are in different forms, fibers, films, foam, beads, pallets, and so forth. It's also observed recently that the plastic in the uh, ground uh, also uh, produces uh, impact uh, as far as the terrestrial applications are concerned in addition to the aquatic ecosystem. And recently some articles indicated that the plastic is uptaken by the plant and is transported along the food chain once they accumulate in the soil. And I'm going to show you some of the modeling a little bit later, showing the routes by which the plastic is actually embedded into the ground and is accumulated. Uh, and of course, as I mentioned, there are modelings for it. The, Ocean contains close to about 5 trillion plastic pieces on an average into the ocean. And what you see on the screen is the microplastics and microplastics which float into the ocean. Uh, uh, and uh, although macroplastics far outweigh microplastics by mass into the ocean, uh, at the present time, uh, the microplastic in ocean although it's not a major problem. This is a problem as far as the uh, rivers are concerned where our water supply comes from. So obviously it poses a major problem for us, but it is estimated that over a period of time, because of the fact the ground continues to accumulate plastic and this eventually would go to the ocean as well. So this will also become a major problem. Uh, what you see on the screen is the plastic concentration in the whole ocean, which is two times 10 to the negative nine, as compared to plastic concentration in highly concentrated river, which is eight times 10 to the negative two. So obviously this has been larger, but by way of this modeling, we see that in future, we will see a lot more microplastics in addition to macroplastic in the ocean. As you see that there are different uh, polymers uh, which we use, and uh, these are some of the polymers which I've shown, but these are only selected uh, polymers uh, which end up into the environment. We also have chemical additives uh, which are added into the plastic. So these additives alter the nature of the plastic to increase their functionality. In addition, uh, of these microplastics because of their large surface area, surface large uh, to, to volume ratio, uh, they uh, have uh, the environment pollutants, they uh, introduce health hazard as is shown in this slide uh, because of either additives or by certain metals. Uh, what you see is the health hazard. Again, this is a brief summary, but nonetheless, a, uh, one can see that microplastics, additives, metals which are added 
continue to introduce a health hazard. One of the health hazard, in addition to the plastic additives, is the uh, nature of the plastic by which it mimics estrogen. And uh, in the following slide, uh, I show that the, uh, as compared to uh, estrogen factor one, some of these plastic have, uh, for example, biphenol, for example, is two times turned to the negative four, uh, which is obviously, if you have large amount of microplastic, that would introduce lots of estrogen. And this is creating a major problem, especially in California, where you would see uh, lots of fish having dual gender. So as I stated that it's becoming a major problem. So we obviously need to find different ways by which uh, we can mitigate this microplastic pollution in the environment. Of course, there's airborne plastic, microplastics as well, which we need to consider, but at least for the timing, I'm going to focus on the uh, microplastics and nanoplastics in the aquatic environment. As you could see from this following slide, uh, that um, uh, there are some latest reports which indicates that in placenta as well, the plastic was discovered. Uh, and in the previous slide, I had mentioned that estrogen or xenoestrogen uh, characteristics of microplastic that obviously uh, create a health hazard in the fish. Uh, there were lots of discovery of the micro ma macro plastics which were observed in fish. And of course, uh, because of the plastic left in the environment, it obviously uh, creates problem for different types of sea life. So we, that's the reason this topic is more relevant for us to study. Although there are thousands of studies of the presence and effect of microplastics in the aquatic species, I have only listed a few, such as the polystyrene microplastic, causing inflammation and lipid, in lipid accumulation, uh, size-dependent toxicity. I'm going to show toxicity in the following slide as well. Uh, and obviously it has neurological impact as well. Microplastic also alter the feeding capacity of the uh, aquatic species. Uh, nanoparticles are found to be easily ingested by some of the aquatic species and tend to acquire gastrointestinal toxicity, liver toxicity, neurotoxicity, and so forth. So as you could see in this slide, that there are more and more studies indicating uh, microplastics becoming a major issue because of the its toxicity and also because of the presence of uh, mimicking estrogen in the environment. And because of the fact that it enters the food chain, of course, we also uh, take intake microplastics in our food. This slide simply goes shows an overview of the exposure, human exposure estimate uh, of microplastics in our food, such as salt, uh, such as the uh, food, tap water, and so forth. And this is only increasing. So it is for that reason, it's more relevant to study this topic and see how we can mitigate microplastics in environment. As I mentioned, the, because of its toxicity, uh, what this slide simply shows is absorption and distribution uh, as, as a function of size. And I'm going to dwell on the microplastics and nanoplastic. We had conducted some study of the neostonic micro neostonic microplastic in the uh, aquatic system. And it seems they tend to float because of the fact they become hydrophobic and they then attract bacteria from the environment and they continue to grow. I'm sure all of us know because of the presence of COVID, uh, SARS virus, uh, there is presence of SARS in the water also. So there are some recent report indicating that the neostonic microplastic attracting SARS virus and of course accumulating on the surface. 
these studies are really recent. There's not much literature on it, but it still indicates the uh, presence of microplastics uh, becoming mystonic and attracting bacteria, uh, causing oxidative stress, gastrointestinal effects, neurotoxicity, and uh, uh, metabolism types of changes. So this needs to be studied. We had looked into nanomaterial and their impact on health. And because that model we had developed, so we are trying to use the model of the nanomaterial into micro and nanoplastic and see if we can study the toxicity of microplastics on human health. There are several mitigation strategies, uh, such as the uh, photo degradation using UV light, using nanomaterials, thermal degradation, biodegradation, microbes, et cetera. But these are the mitigation strategies. What I would like to show is use of biopolymers and bioplastics, which are biodegradable so that we don't uh, have to use this mitigation strategies, which I have listed in this particular slide. So looking into the uh, this uh, quadrants, four quadrants I've shown here, these are the conventional plastics which are used for the production of plastics. What we have proposed is because of the fact nature has tremendous amount of plastic, we are beginning to use now bioplastics, which are bio-based, uh, either in this quadrant, whether they are bio-based, sorry, bio-based, non-biodegradable, bio-based, biodegradable. More specifically, we are trying to use bioplastics in this particular regime, which are biodegradable and also bio-based. <laughs> if we can upcycle, these plastics rather than recycle, then I think we can reduce the environmental impact of uh, micro nanoplastics going forward. This is also true by the trend of the biopolymers by the market segment. As you see, the market for the biopolymer is continuing to increase. That shows that there is a uh, obviously um, a trend to use biopolymers going forward. And uh, this trend obviously will continue to increase to shift from uh, fossil-based polymers to bio-based polymers or chemical-based polymers to bio-based polymers. So this is something which we'd like to do. So what I'm going to show in the next few slides is some of the experiments which we have done. As I mentioned, we do uh, electrospinning to develop different types of plastics. Uh, we are using uh, biopolymers to make those. And that's again, a very small contribution in this large uh, problem of microplastics which we have. So I'm going to show you e-textile and ubiquitous sensing, which we produce by using electrospinning. These are some of the standalone uh, application of sensors, uh, which we use for different types of application, may it be for security, may it be for health and medicine, uh, etc. cetera. Um, we use actually PVDF polymer to produce uh, 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 electrical energy for electrical, uh, for energy harvesting. As you know, PVDF is a piezoelectric plastic, uh, it's uh, by application of pressure, it produces a voltage and also by a process called polling, that means you apply temperature uh, and then extend, then it produces electricity. So using PVDF, we are uh, producing electricity for different types of application. So this slide simply shows that by uh, PVDF, one can, using its piezoelectric characteristics, one can uh, harvest energy, which is used for different application, may it be a sensors or may it be energy harvesting types of application. 
So I'm going to show you in the following slides, uh, electro spinning, which we have used uh, and how we use PVDF in those application. Electro spinning, as I'm sure all of you know, is a fairly straightforward technique where you use a polymer uh, by simply application of electric field with respect to electrode. Uh, using electrohydrodynamics, the polymer jets out. And of course, you can then form a uh, membrane. And using this polymer, uh, we are now beginning to replace bipolymers, which I'll show you in the following slide. We can make these uh, membranes for, again, multiple types of application. This is uh, a slide where we had produced, uh, used different types of polymer. This simply shows their composition and loading, and of course, the types of application which uh, we can use these uh, membranes for. Now we have started to use uh, green synthesis, meaning thereby the biopolymers, and using this biopolymers, again, we are using for application, uh, which are essentially for biomedical types of applications, such as wound dressing, tissue scaffolds, and so forth. And because these are biopolymers, they are biodegradable. So obviously that reduces its environmental impact. And based on this, there are lots of electro spinning uh, machines which can uh, be purchased from the, uh, which can be purchased commercially. And uh, we are working these with this commercial manufacturer to use biopolymers so that it has less environmental impact. We also use 3D, 4D printing uh, to use as a scaffold so that using a combination of 3D printing and electro spinning, we can still continue to make different applications. Uh, but then again, they are you know, environmentally friendly. This is one uh, application uh, which we use for filtration types of application, uh, such as water desalination, water purification, uh, variable anti-dehydration systems and so forth. So uh, I'm going to show you next two or three slides where I'm going to show the biopolymers in tactile sensing and some of the tribal electric uh, devices. Again, since I have only half an hour, I don't think I want to go into technology convergence accelerator program. So I'm going to simply talk about the biopolymers in tactile sensing. And then after that, I'm going to close the presentation. So these are some of the PVDF-based nanofibers, which were made using electrospanning. And simply by application of stress in different direction, we can produce electricity. Uh, the characteristics at the bottom shows the Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy uh, and the uh, Raman shift which simply indicates the structure is that of PVDF. So by simply applying stress, uh, we can change the strain. And uh, we have looked at as a piezocapacitive uh, force sensor. What that means is that you apply stress and then it changes the capacitance. So what that means is that we can make sensors based on these types of application. Some yeah. other characteristics of PVDF nanofiber, temperature versus the permittivity, uh, and of course the, uh, uh, we have looked at the frequency dependence, temperature dependence, and so forth of this PVDF membrane. But the application being uh, different types of uh, energy harvested sensors, which we can use uh, for different types of application, uh, especially for, as mentioned, for biomedical application and also for security types of applications. Uh, different types of configurations are shown in this slide. And this uh, is obviously its use is increasing. And uh, we also use this for structural health monitoring as well. So this again shows a large spectrum of applications which are used. But then again, as mentioned that what I have shown is only a small portion of what 
uh, experimentally we can contribute to reducing the impact of microplastics in environment because of its tremendous use for electronics, packaging, and so forth. We have to make a concentrated effort so that uh, we could shift from polymer-based plastic to bioplastics, biodegradable plastics, upcycling, so that the environmental impact of the uh, uh, of microplastic is reduced. Uh, we also use uh, these uh, materials for several biomedical applications. Again, the time would not permit me to go into all these biomedical applications, but nonetheless, there are lots of biomedical applications which are shown in this slide. So as we continue to look for more and more application, that means we are using more and more polymer uh, that means we need to be more sensitive to make sure that the impact of polymers in aquatic, in air, uh, in soil, obviously continues to reduce as a function of time. So I'm not going to go into this technology convergence model because of the limitation of time. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, as mentioned, I wanted to point out that because of the fact that microplastics is becoming a major issue. We need to uh, look into ways by which uh, we can find ways to reduce the environmental impact of micro nanoplastics. And also at the same time, I'm working with lots of folks in medical field so that we can continue to study the uh, toxicity of micro nanoplastics and their impact on human health as well. So with that, there are lots of colleagues, those who continue to work with me. Uh, some of them are shown here. Uh, and of course, there's a lot more uh, people, those who work with that. So with that, let me thank all of you for your kind attention. And I'm obviously open to questions if you have any for me. Thank you. Well, may I ask a question? Dear Professor, no. some, question. Okay. some question, please. Please, sure. Yes, Absolutely. yes. Uh, it seems uh, that uh, on diagrams which you had demonstrated, one can see exponential growth of plastic production from year to year. Mm -hmm. And to be compared with, for instance, uh, well known Moore law for computers, mm -hmm. uh, where uh, every three or five years, uh, you have two-fold increase in uh, amount of transistors in uh, the capacity of operative memory and so on. And now for Moore's law, we can see that there is saturation and no more two-fold increase. Uh, can you uh, tell something similar for plastics? Good question. Um... You know, the, um, first of all, let me say that because we are now so dependent on plastic, I don't think that uh, replacing plastic, although there is a lot of effort uh, on the part of people, those who are not in favor of plastic to actually completely eliminate the plastic. I don't think that will ever happen, that we will not depend on plastic or computers or cell phones or um, automobiles, even parts of aircraft, et cetera, they are all made of plastic. So yes, you're right that this, the, the, uh, it will continue to increase. What I see as a saturation is use of bipolymer uh, plastics uh, versus the uh, polymer-based plastics. Uh, uh, that's where I see the uh, saturation coming in. But the use of plastic will continue to increase. Uh, and that's the reason I used a term called upcycling. What that simply means is that rather than depending on recycling, if we can upcycle the plastic at the front end, that would reduce the load of recycling at the later stage. What that means is we are designing plastic in advance uh, for a specific application so that we know that we are going to use it for five years. At the end of five years, 
of course, uh, you know, you, you could then recycle accordingly rather than plastic bottle, for example. Some of the plastic bottles, they are used for uh, recycling two times or three times. I think there's a little bit of upcycling goes there, but I think what I see saturation is the uh, ratio of uh, plastics which are designed for specific purpose. That's where I see the uh, uh, saturation. But the question is good, uh, and I don't have the real answer uh, to the to the questions which you have asked. But it's a good question. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, uh, dear Professor Vasashta, thank you for the presentation about mi uh, micro um, nanoplastic, which is very, very interesting and useful. We invite uh, you to cooperate with our Institute, Institute of Chemistry of the Republic of Moldova. Um, thank you. Uh, absolutely. As a matter of fact, I'm going to transform this into a publication and for the uh, journal of which comes out of Moldova, for which I'm also one of on the editorial board. I want to put that in a publication form. So I'll send that along in probably a couple of months. Thank you for the invitation of this wonderful uh, event. And I'd like to thank uh, Professor Duca for his kind advice that um, even if I am a physicist, that I can talk on uh, something quite uh, relevant to your uh, conference. So I'd like to talk on the nuclear waste management in Korea. And before that, I, I would like to uh, say happy birthday, uh, academician Duke. Uh, uh, and La Multiani, is it, uh, is it okay? Is it right? Yeah. Yes, and uh, I would like to also celebrate that uh, he has received a very important uh, prize last year for his work on the redox processes in aqua systems. So, so I think I, I celebrate him. So uh, my talk is like this. Uh, first, I, I'd like to introduce um, a short warm up, and then I would like to introduce uh, nuclear program in Korea. And then uh, I'll describe the nuclear waste management in Korea and how to live with uh, those nuclear waste. And then a uh, short closing comment. <clears throat> well, uh, there are some countries that are called the nuclear country. And you, you probably know that if a country has either nuclear power plants or nuclear warheads, the country is called as a nuclear country. And uh, how many nuclear countries are there in the world? Among about uh, 200 sovereign states, more than 160 of them are not nuclear countries. They are free of nuclear, nuclear whatsoever. So about less than 40 countries are nuclear countries. Indeed, I have uh, shared these slides with uh, uh, Sally Revesley and uh, uh, my World Federation of Scientists colleagues. And so I'm repeating uh, this uh, slides. And first, let us talk about the nuclear electricity. According to IAEA, there are 30 countries as of 2022 that generate electricity using nuclear reactors. The United States, China, France are, are big countries in this field. And uh, South Korea is also there. And down, you will see the United Arab Emirates and Belarus down there. So there are 32 countries. And then nuclear warheads. How many countries have nuclear warheads? According to a United States think tank, there are nine countries that possess nuclear warheads, including, of course, Russia and the United States and Israel and North Korea. So there are nine countries. You probably have seen these pictures as well. 
there are nine countries. Russia on the right hand side and the United States on the left hand side. And in between there are uh, seven countries, including China, North Korea, and Israel. And uh, you know, there among these nine nuclear countries, those have uh, nuclear warheads, seven countries has both nuclear power plants and nuclear warheads. So two countries have only nuclear warheads, but no nuclear electricity. Thus, there are 34 nuclear countries in total. I can, I can uh, graph these 34 countries into one graph where the x-axis is the nuclear electricity power, electric power, and the y-axis is the nuclear warheads. You see that Russia, uh, United States here and Russia here, they, all, they both produce electricity and the nuclear warheads. Uh, and, and here you see that Israel and North Korea, they have no nuclear electricity, but they have nuclear warheads. And most of the other countries have only nuclear electric power and no nuclear warheads. And I, I, I can, I can uh, group them into, into three categories, into three groups like this. You see that uh, group A spend uh, their nuclear strengths. Uh, they mean, I mean the strengths of technology and the resources of, of the nuclear engineering onto the production of nuclear warheads, these two countries. And uh, at group C, group C, these the green countries, uh, they use the nuclear technology and resources, uh, so-called peacefully. And here, group B, you see that group B, it is a mainstream of the nuclear countries. They produce both nuclear electricity and nuclear warheads. So, we may we may say that uh, group C has the potentials to have nuclear warheads. So, for example, uh, uh, IISS or the U.S. think tank has already mentioned that in 2010 uh, that Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan are capable of producing multiple dozens of nuclear warheads. Uh, so, so if, uh, for, for example, Iran emerges as a nuclear uh, country into the mainstream, so we, it, is, uh, it would be a very trouble to some to, to Korea. But however, these are not my, uh, these are not, uh, this is not my uh, point of uh, talk. My point is that not only the nuclear warheads, but also nuclear electricity uh, is recently a, a objected or disliked in Korea. As environmental consciousness has been sharpened these days, in these years, the nuclear energy is regarded as not as clean or CO2 free energy, but as a very seriously seriously threatening source of environmental contamination by some Korean activist groups. So before discussing on this uh, environmental uh, issue, let us look back the history of the nuclear program in Korea. It has started uh, about uh, 70 years ago after the Korean World War, Korean War in between 1952 uh, 1953, Korea has established a section in the government for nuclear energy on March 1956 to make relevant laws and regulations to legalize the government structures, the bureaucratic hierarchy, or the research institute, and to build nuclear reactors for research and to develop human resources for nuclear program. It was uh, 1956, yes, yeah, almost 70 years ago. 
And then uh, Korea has joined the IAEA in 1957 when IAEA has been established in the same year under the auspice of UN. So in this way, Korea has started its first step into nuclear program. And then uh, 1959, uh, trigger mark two has begun to be built. The construction has completed uh, on 1962. Yeah. It, it has uh, continued its operation, 33 years operation and uh, uh, finished in January, 1995. Yeah. This is the first research reactor and then a uh, further progress has been done. In 1969, Trigger Mark II was upgraded. In 1972, Trigger Mark III has begun its operation. In 1987, a multi purpose reactor named Hanaro was approved and uh, uh, was completed in 1995, just before uh, the Mark II was uh, finished. This is Hanaro. And, uh, you see that it has uh, very complex uh, facilities within the, uh, this uh, institution. And uh, you will see that this is the main reactors in, in, in this building, these five store buildings. This is uh, uh, one major step into the nuclear research in Korea. And then Korea began to build the nuclear power reactors for nuclear electricity. At that time, nuclear electric power had been dubbed as the third light. Uh, the first light was the natural fire, and the second light is the electricity, and nuclear electric power is called as the third light. And uh, in 1956, just three years after the Korean War, the Committee for Nuclear Electric Power was established within the government. The construction site, the size of electricity production, I mean, the size of the electricity capability, the managing institution and the contractor, etc., was decided yeah. until the government groundbreaking took place in March 71. This is the uh, picture of the first uh, nuclear power plant built in Kori uh, Kori area. Details of Gori uh, nuclear power plant is that uh, 590 megawatt uh, capacity, and the cost uh, at that time was uh, uh, 1. Point, uh, 0. 0.17 billion US dollars plus the matching fund of the same size from Korea which was about 5% of Korean GDP at that time. And managing institution, Korea Electricity Corporation. And contractor was Westinghouse Electric Company USA and completion and operation start in 1978. And this nuclear power plant was uh, phased out uh, five years ago, 2017. After that, a number of nuclear power plants was built, were built like the 70s, the first one, and 80s, the, uh, the second step, the 90s and 2000 and so on. Uh, we have built uh, about more than 20 nuclear power plants. Yeah. And these are uh, the nuclear power plants scattered along the coastline of the South Korea. And the, here, the statistic is that 24 is in operation now, and two was stopped, phased out, the Gori one, uh, the Gori one and the Warsaw one, and uh, four is under construction, and two was postponed, and four was discarded. This the postponed and the discard of the nuclear power plant is the mainly due to the environmentalist uh, 
opposition. So we no more build uh, nuclear power plants, except the four of them under constructions. These are the numbers of shut down. There are two shut downs and uh, there are four under constructions and the remaining is uh, postponed or discarded. So now the total capacity of nuclear electric power of the 24 unit is uh, 25 gigawatt, consisting about 29% uh, of total electricity as of 2021. And meanwhile, Korea has successfully developed its own design and its own technology so as to export four of these, its prototype light water reactors uh, to United Arab Emirates and Jordan in December 2009. Such a success uh, mm, has challenges uh, and caveats within the country by the environmental list. So four of them has been discarded and two of them suspended and so on. And uh, uh, the government, the, the present government decided to carry out the policy of nuclear power phase out a la Germany. That means uh, no more additional nuclear power plants, no extension or upgrade of existing nuclear power plants, and then develop environmental, environment friendly, cheaper substitute for renewable energy sources, such as solar energy. The, the opposition party criticized that the government chose the wrong policy of giving up the cheapest CO2-free energy sources. And those, the opposition party regarded as nuclear energy is at the moment the cheapest and CO2-free energy. But the government thinks otherwise. So the hot debates are ongoing among these political parties. And uh, in addition, the nuclear waste problem is the uh, national agenda. This is the main point of my talk. The radioactive waste is classified according to the rate of the thermal emission and the rate of alpha particle emissions. If the thermal emission is more than two kilowatts per cubic meters, and uh, if the radiative uh, alpha particle is uh, more than 4,000 becquerel per gram, the, the waste is classified as the high level waste. High level nuclear waste are produced, as you know, that by a product of reactors, reaction that occurs inside the nuclear reactors. They are spent to react to fuel when it is accepted for disposal. And in addition, the waste materials are remaining after those spent for re reprocessed, reprocessed. Thus, there are two processes. First, the nuclear power plant, and second, from the reprocessing factory. But uh, Korea is not allowed to have reprocessing factory because in principle, uh, uh, the reprocessing factory may saturate the spent uh, fuel to make plutoniums. They, make, they can be used uh, in producing nuclear warheads. So Korea has no repro reprocessing factory. So we do the, the, the nuclear waste option to be dumped somewhere in Korea. Yeah. So the high level nuclear waste that are produced from the nuclear electric power should be dumped somewhere. They say that the globally accumulated amount of high level nuclear waste are about uh, 300, more than 300,000 uh, cubic meters and Korea contributes about 4% of them, like 14,000 cubic meters, which is about half of the Germany stock. Now the problem is the dumping sites. 
from 86 to 89, a mountain site was uh, selected, but a uh, fierce uh, local opposition has annihilated the selection. And since then, 1991, 1995, 2004, 2005, a number of uh, selection sites was uh, repeatedly failed. Uh, we think that it's a kind of NIMBY phenomenon. But anyway, uh, we couldn't, uh, the Korean government couldn't decide a high level nuclear waste dumping site as yet. These are the pictures of the Korean communities, uh, demonstrations, uh, just a few of them, but uh, there have been a number of uh, demonstrations to object to the dumping site. Meanwhile, a uh, depository for the medium and low level nuclear waste has been selected in 2005 and uh, to be built in Gyeongju area like this. The government plan is that uh, by 2024, the high level uh, nuclear waste uh, uh, dumping site should be decided. Geological survey be finished in 2028, and then 2053, the facility will be completed. Yeah. This means uh, by that time, we would uh, dump the nuclear waste and we would have no nuclear power plants except four. So uh, let me uh, close uh, uh, with these comments. It is from now a 30 years uh, time span. By 2053, Korea may turn into a non-nuclear country that has neither nuclear warheads no nuclear power plants. And it may be capable of decoding uh, nuclear waste somewhere in deep underground facilities safely and securely. And the remaining uh, one issue is the where to build. It should be decided in 2024. A huge sum of uh, financial incentives uh, is mentioned among the politicians because it should be handed over to the local community, so then they would accept the uh, dumping site. Uh, so this is the uh, ongoing, this, this uh, negotiation is ongoing. Thank you. Uh, professor, professor Vasashka, please moderate uh, the the session, please. Professor Vasashka. Yes. Okay. For question. Okay. Any question for Professor? Oh. Well, definitely yes. I yeah, have sure. a question. Please go ahead. Uh, uh, you had told us about only one source of uh, radioactive waste namely uh, spent nuclear fuel. But there's uh, another one uh, which is uh, concerned with uh, aerosol uh, products which are permanently going out of, uh, of working uh, power, nuclear power plants. And it includes uh, inert uh, radioactive gases, uh, starting with argon and cesium, iodine, which maybe is uh, most important. And some of them are uh, collected by filters and some of them goes directly to the atmosphere. And maybe this kind of waste gives more becquerels to the environment than uh, concentrated uh, spent nuclear fuel. Is it so or not? Yes, yes, uh, indeed, indeed. Uh, but uh, in my talk, I just talked about uh, solid type, not the uh, radioactive gases or the contaminated waters uh, like the Fukushima reactor accident. Uh, I'm just talking about the, the uh, spent fuel. Yes. First of all, I would like to uh, join to all congratulations to 
uh, our dear friend George Duca, who had organized our meeting. Occasionally, it was unlike the circumstances that we can't uh, meet meet in life, so we uh, have contacts only online. And uh, this is one of the reasons why I would try to be as brief as possible, because I had prepared uh, the text, which will be maybe proper uh, for a uh, case when I can see the eyes of my audience. And when I can see only this screen, I think the better idea will be not to follow this text uh, <laughs> during the coffee break, I tried to read it and get boring myself. So I'm afraid that it's not necessary to make pain for uh, our audience. I'll try to explain the um, sense of our work and uh, the main topics of this presentation uh, just by fingertips. So uh, the question is about uh, mathematical models uh, for uh, Prediction of contaminations. Well, wow. Maybe like this. Okay. Uh, contamination of uh, environment. Usually, uh, you have uh, any kind of maybe man made industrial waste or agricultural waste, or it can be the uh, result of uh, um, just environmental disasters. And uh, normally, when you are trying to uh, construct mathematical model of uh, how the uh, pollution will behave in the environment, you first need to have a physical model. A uh, couple of years ago, I had uh, one of the orders uh, when I tried to explain that uh, <laughs> the order of this order asked, uh, please don't make me tired with physical model, just equations. Uh, we need all the mathematical model without physics. And it took some time uh, for me to explain that uh, mathematical model itself is senseless without uh, the physical model. And for instance, we can take uh, the reference book by Jorgensen, where uh, exactly 1,000 mathematical models for the uh, environmental and ecological chemistry. And uh, you see that uh, there are no such amount of physical laws or mathematical equations or calculation of algorithms. Uh, so that means that uh, no one of them is universal and no one of them is uh, good enough to be recommended for all kinds of uh, our problems. Nevertheless, there are uh, some universal features that uh, the uh, general pathway of any uh, pollutant is either go down to the soil or evaporate to atmosphere. And in both cases, the <coughs> final point of any pollutant is the ocean. Uh, of course, it is a problem because uh, the ocean is not endless. Uh, anyhow, it is very bulky. And uh, if we compare, for instance, uh, dissolved organic carbon, uh, which can be, uh, let's say, from the uh, plastics or from uh, oil pollution or uh, other kinds of uh, salvo releases, uh, the amount of uh, carbon in the uh, bottom sediments is uh, maybe one million times higher. So the capacity of the ocean, at least for uh, next 100 years, it's sufficient to accumulate everything. And if there is good pathway to the bottom of the ocean, and so for um, mankind, it's just the problem is solved. Ocean uh, will take care what will happen further. The main problem is when uh, you see the uh, exactly uh, sour release, uh, that means the, the, that the concentration and the uh, figure of uh, spot is not steady state. When it works uh, from day to day, uh, 
you uh, have steady state picture and simply it can uh, have small fluctuations and uh, from the point of view of modeling it's a very simple and not interesting case much more interesting case is when uh, you have very high concentration in the epicenter of uh, pollution spot and uh, you need to forecast and calculate how it will uh, Leaf and how it will spread in space and in time. And uh, generally, you have uh, just uh, the basic mass transfer equation, which is completely equivalent to the uh, well known uh, heat transfer equation. The laws for uh, mass and heat transfer are exactly the same. And uh, don't be uh, very peculiar, we uh, can see here only three terms. And let's not to go in and uh, just we can say that uh, first term is uh, corresponding to process of diffusion. So this is uh, some kind of probability uh, stochastic process uh, when uh, the direction is uh, not determined. The second term is uh, concerned with uh, determined uh, direction of uh, spread and it is uh, convective uh, mass transfer and the third one is uh, exactly chemical reaction chemical transformation it can be either redox uh, reactions or hydrolysis or uh, evaporation or something uh, for uh, mathematical point of view it's just the same and uh, it can be written in more compact form using uh, nabla Hamilton's operator and Nabo squared, uh, which is uh, operator of Laplace. So it looks uh, very nice, but it is not so, it's not nice for uh, modeling, for calculation. Even in case, if you uh, take uh, the simplest first diffusive uh, term, uh, neglecting uh, second and third ones, then uh, you have a fundamental solution of the uh, heat transfer or mass transfer equation, which is given by Gauss function. Uh, also, it looks not uh, very complicated. And uh, we can look on its profiles. Here is the uh, Gaussian itself. Here is the first derivative. And here is the second derivative of Gaussian. And to make a numerical modeling of uh, mass transfer equation, you at least need to calculate accurately the second derivative. It seems uh, promising, and we can use, uh, for instance, uh, Taylor series. And uh, if we'll take five point approximation, it uh, looks, at least on the graph, on the diagram, it looks perfect. Anyhow, it isn't so, because uh, even smallest uh, discrepancies uh, of theoretical curve from uh, numerical modeling gives, uh, because we have positive feedback, it gives oscillations uh, and uh, shows instability in the uh, solution. It starts from small uh, fluctuations, then they, on, after uh, few steps of integration, they became bigger. And on the uh, plots, uh, um, on the bottom side of uh, this slide, on the left and on the right side, uh, the amplitude of fluctuation is much bigger than uh, even original amplitude of uh, normal signal. So uh, the quality of such model is unbelievably bad. And first, uh, uh, first decision, which uh, seems uh, that it can improve the situation, how it is, uh, we have in Russian proverb that uh, it's never when the nut is going too tight, you just simply uh, have to take a hammer, a bigger one hammer. And in case of uh, solution of uh, mass transfer equation, uh, it looks like a good decision that will uh, crash and will split step. On the previous side, it was, uh, slide, it was uh, 
not uh, point uh, twenty. Uh, that's mean one fifth. And here it is. Uh, Sorry. May I continue? Hello. Is anybody here? Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, uh, I'll continue. Yeah. So if we uh, will take uh, several times uh, more short step, uh, it uh, seems that uh, it will have no noises on the uh, beginning of our modeling, but after several steps, it again will give uh, fluctuations which are more important than uh, main signal. And uh, the problem is uh, in the equation itself, so we must have uh, some kind of uh, explicit, uh, implicit uh, algorithm of calculation. But it is very time consuming. And uh, the, uh, our decision was to use not uh, solving of uh, differential equations, but uh, go to the direct modeling by uh, method or by Monte Carlo. It is that we simply uh, have a set of points. Uh, every point uh, corresponds to the particle of pollutant. And uh, on each step, we uh, have direct calculation of probabilities uh, corresponding to diffusion or uh, drift or chemical transformation. First uh, step, uh, first, uh, first position of our modeling is we must prepare a grid. Uh, it is important to take into account that normally the uh, co coordinate is a square root of uh, time. That means that uh, if for normal kinetics you need about 100 points, that means that uh, one or two tens uh, from uh, minus 10 to plus 10 in space coordinates, it will be absolutely enough. And we consider that in each cage, uh, like in, uh, how it is called, uh, sea battle, uh, everybody in school played in such, uh, in such game. Uh, and we see that in each cage, uh, the concentration of pollutant will be uh, the same. In uh, different cages, so different, but inside we make no difference uh, between uh, inner side or uh, our side or, uh, or what is on the borders. And then uh, on the second step, we uh, make, uh, here it is called first step, but first step is greed. The second step is to solve. We put uh, some amount of points of pollution and we'll follow every one of it. Uh, normally, we must take about, uh, it is uh, two to the 10th power. Uh, we might, uh, must take uh, about 1000 points or a little bit more. And it will be enough for a very good presentation of this model because uh, this gives, uh, the accuracy about 3% and normally it is more than enough for uh, ecological modeling. Here we can see uh, the same uh, spot of pollution, but in uh, two dimensional presentation. Uh, we uh, neglect the third coordinate because uh, normally, uh, even in case of uh, nuclear waste, uh, we can, uh, calculate a plane model uh, without uh, vertical coordinate. For instance, uh, if we uh, look on uh, radioactive, radioactive waste from nuclear plants, the uh, altitude will be uh, about a couple of hundred meters. And the uh, horizontal coordinates will be about a couple of hundred kilometers. For instance, uh, if we look on uh, oil waste, uh, normally it goes to the soil uh, on the depth 
like 20 centimeters. And uh, the uh, size of the spot can be 20 kilometers. So the plane model, uh, two dimensional model, it will be absolutely enough for uh, the vast majority of predictions. Then next step, we must uh, determine the field of velocities. It can look like this, like that, or it can be uh, sometimes very tricky. But uh, for the uh, most important uh, tasks, there are absolutely enough simplest models with uh, constant field or with, uh, uh, here we can see what will uh, happen in case if we have river with vertical, vertical in uh, sense of this diagram. That means from south to north, uh, vertical transfer uh, of pollution and uh, there will be uh, horizontal flows which corresponds uh, for a transfer of, let's say, agricultural uh, pollutions with uh, uh, along soil with rains. So the, these two scenarios are uh, most important and uh, we can look uh, how it will uh, then behave uh, in time and for instance, here, this is the simplest uh, modeling of uh, fluctuations. Now we must uh, take uh, another approach. Uh, how uh, the here is a special uh, distribution, and uh, on the next slide you can see the time distribution uh, for uh, one selected cage uh, before this time. Uh, the uh, pollution spot doesn't achieve this point, and after that it uh, goes through. So we can see uh, the kinetic curve like this. Here is the same curve, but after uh, splining, after smoothing with uh, uh, with kind of spline, uh, this is the reason why we use uh, degrees of two, namely uh, 1,024 points because uh, for uh, such filtering, we uh, must make uh, fast Fourier transform, which usually in, uh, in normal systems, it uh, works only with uh, 512 or 1024 with uh, numbers like this. Then on the next slide, uh, we can see uh, just normal pure drift without diffusion and without chemical transformation. On the left side, we can see the prediction of Monte Carlo model. And on the right side, it is uh, the numerical uh, solution of uh, heat transfer, mass transfer equation by Kren Nicholson uh, scheme. It is uh, one of variants, very powerful variants of implicit scheme of uh, modeling. Anyhow, we can see uh, noise on the left uh, part of the uh, modeling pod. Here we have no such such distortions uh, due to positive feedback. So uh, Monte Carlo approach is uh, more powerful and more peculiar, more exact than uh, direct solution of a set of differential equations. Next uh, case, uh, this is just uh, pure degradation without drift, without diffusion. We start from the uh, high level of pollution and in time it goes down. Uh, this is just uh, chemical degradation. Next case, uh, this is uh, pure diffusion. It is the most interesting uh, slide because we can start, for instance, with a rectangular distribution. And uh, this demonstrates that uh, Gaussian is not occasionally uh, the fundamental solution of this equation. We can start from uh, a rectangle, triangle, any kind of distribution. After a few steps, it will become Gaussian. And uh, exactly the same we can see on uh, solution by uh, Craig Nicholson. So again, we have uh, the complete correspondence of Monte Carlo approach and uh, solution of uh, differential equation. But uh, for this algorithm, we spend 
maybe 20 times less of uh, computer time, uh, it is uh, much more, much more fast. And here uh, is comparison of all three uh, processes. Uh, that means chemical degradation, diffusion, the spot becomes more broad and it moves to the right due to drift. And again, we can see a complete correspondence between Monte Carlo and uh, numerical solution. Exactly the same thing for kinetics. Uh, this uh, case, uh, the calculation was uh, a little bit more than 10 seconds. And here, when we have, uh, this is very exact curve, uh, including uh, 16 accumulations for 16,000 particles. In case if we will take 1,000 particles and one accumulation, it will uh, last only uh, less than one tenth of a second and gives exactly the same kinetic curve. The difference in calculated uh, rate constant is less than 3%, how we promised when we took uh, 10, uh, 10 units of coordinates uh, in uh, horizontal and uh, in X and Y directions and about 100 steps in time. And uh, next slide demonstrates that uh, sometimes the kinetic curves for different points in the landscape can uh, have a wide variety of uh, very bizarre uh, shapes like this. And sometimes they correspond to first order reactions, especially if uh, chemical degradation dominates. Sometimes it looks like this and you have no good approximation. You have only numerical modeling by uh, either a solution of set of differential equations or by Monte Carlo. Next very interesting thing is uh, what will happen if uh, we have adsorption of uh, pollutant to the soil. Normally the uh, behavior of uh, substance which can be adsorbed is given by a well-known isotherm uh, of land mill. This is uh, this equation, K, K A in the nominator and one plus K A in the denominator. And sub zero is the uh, total capacity of uh, adsorbate, uh, adsorbent. And uh, this uh, shape of curve is well known. Anyhow, we need uh, absolutely different solution. We need, uh, this is uh, a view from a point of view of adsorbent and we need the point of view of adsorbate because we uh, must calculate uh, what fraction, what amount of uh, pollutant will be free, only free adsorbate, uh, only free uh, not adsorbed pollutant uh, can move and for us uh, it is given uh, with quite simple but maybe a little bit bulky question, this is solution of uh, just uh, second order uh, usual square equation, very simple. And uh, it gives uh, profiles like this. Uh, when the uh, equilibrium constant, uh, the, until uh, the whole surface is filled, we have no free substance. And after that, we have uh, uh, linear dependence. If the uh, equilibrium constant is small, we from the very beginning have proportionality. Mm -hmm. And uh, if we'll uh, divide uh, this amount on the uh, total amount of pollutant, it will be the uh, ratio, this will be the fraction or effective of uh, rate constant uh, for diffusion. And it looks like this. Now uh, we can Maybe it will work, or I don't know, will or not. No, no, he doesn't work. Uh, I have a movie how it uh, spreads, but uh, maybe next time, not now. And uh, this is the initial distribution, and uh, this is the final result, which we can uh, obtain after a lot of steps. And on the uh, next set of pictures, we can see that it starts here, then uh, moves, and the concentration of pollutant is on the front side, then here, 
Next one, next one, and next one. Here is uh, 10 steps, 25, 50, 100 steps, uh, 200 steps. It is very important to emphasize that, look, the, uh, the concentration of uh, pollutant on the front side of spot. Uh, it looks maybe a little bit strange, but if uh, you will remember how works wine or milk or anything uh, which, uh, which you pour on the uh, cloth, you remember that it works exactly in the same manner. So it simply demonstrates that the model is very adequate. And here are uh, the one dimensional and two dimensional profile of uh, pollution uh, distribution. And we can see that uh, really it has the maximum concentration uh, on the uh, front side of the spot. So uh, this is a very powerful approach. It is, uh, first we have uh, open source code in uh, VBA, Visual Basic for Analysis and Excel. And if everybody is interested in uh, using our software, I can give it absolutely free for uh, anybody after his request. And uh, either you uh, can simply, uh, catch the main idea that it's much more cheap to follow one uh, particle and uh, analyze uh, probabilities of different fates for it than to solve uh, quite uh, tricky uh, and uh, with positive feedback, uh, unstable system of uh, kinetic equations. The uh, calculation time is maybe 10 times, maybe up to 100 times shorter in case of Monte Carlo. So uh, this is, uh, that's all what I would like to tell to you. And uh, we make some uh, forecasts, uh, which are usually not very exact, not very accurate. And normally all forecasts are, uh, are never uh, followed by nature. And perhaps my uh, forecast will be also not <laughs> so accurate and it's also not true. Thank you very much. That's all what I uh, had to say. Now I will come to my presentation. Uh, in my presentation, I will try to touch the ecological uh, problems from a particular point of view, more specifically, the influence of microwave and ultrasounds concerning green chemistry. How could, how could these two tools use it rationally in uh, heterocycle chemistry and in chemistry generally could solve some problems related to the green chemistry and ecological problems. So in my team, we are focused in the area of um, heterocycle chemistry, mostly in the nitrogen heterocycle chemistry, but I will not go in detail concerning this. Before I start, I wish to present you only two slides, one concerning ultrasound and one concerning a microwave. Um, most of you are relatively familiar with the ultrasounds, and uh, you know very well that uh, my ultrasound irradiation, it's a very powerful uh, tool that could be used in uh, chemistry. Why is that? Because uh, it could increase the reactivity on chemical reaction by nearly one million fold. So how it is doing this, right now the mechanism, uh, it's uh, quite uh, well known. So uh, it's related to the um, uh, compression of the uh, bubble and to the um, cavitation phenomena. The bubble uh, increase 
and to a moment collapse and then they release a lot of energy. And in this way, uh, they could produce a lot of heat and um, accelerate the reactions. In the case of microwave, uh, there are several theories that explain the effect of uh, microwave irradiation in chemistry. There are uh, mostly uh, accepted that the electromagnetic, uh, the electric uh, component of the magnetic, uh, of the electromagnetic wave, uh, cause the heating in the in the um, uh, chemical reaction by two mechanisms: dipolar polarization mechanism and ionic conduction mechanism. In the first one, the dipoles are involved, and in the second one, the uh, the ions are uh, involved. However, it seems that the contribution of the ionic conduction mechanism is determinate and much powerful. Uh, during the time, and even now, it was uh, uh, talked uh, about uh, some specific effect of microwave. Um, these are still highly debated. We bring our own contribution in this respect and um, as some other scientists, we believe that this specific effect of microwave could function only in some particular cases. In the others, in the greatest majority of the uh, of the um, of the uh, involving of microwave in uh, chemistry, it is very clear that. The uh, effect is causing uh, is caused by the heating effect. Uh, in my presentation, okay, I will present you how microwave and um, ultrasound could affect the reaction pathway uh, in different type of reaction, and I will focus to uh, uh, quaternization, alkylation, acylation. Uh, and uh, cycloaddition reactions. So, as I told you, we are interested in obtaining uh, nitrogen heterocycles uh, with uh, different environment uh, 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 around them. Uh, in this case, for instance, uh, in order to get our compounds, we start from this dehydroxyacetophenone and we done first an um, uh, etherification here. Then after we done the etherification, we done a bromuration here, and then uh, we did the quaternization. So basically you have three type of reaction here. Esterification, uh, etherification here, uh, then bromuration, and then an alkylation. And I will treat it all one by one, and I will present you the influence of microwave and ultrasound. Let's talk first about the uh, oxygen alkylation. Um, we done this uh, under uh, conventional method, uh, under conventional thermal heating, and also under microwave and ultrasound irradiation. And the behavior uh, of these two reagent um, related to these three different sources of energy was different according with the, the type of uh, energy that we use it. When you use uh, conventional thermal heating, you may notice from here that the reaction time is high and we was able to get only some components, particularly this one, which are double etherificated. But this one that it is also of importance for us, we don't realize to obtain it under conventional thermal heating. Then we move to a microwave and ultrasound irradiation. And as you could notice here, the reaction time in, in the case of use of a, a microwave and ultrasound decrease substantially. And also the yields comparative with the thermal heating are uh, increasing. You may notice also that we was able under uh, microwave and ultrasound to get this mono uh, O-alkylated compound that 
under conventional uh, thermal heating, it is not possible. So as a conclusion for this first orthoalkylation or alkylation reaction, we may say that under microwave and ultrasound irradiation, the reaction time decreased substantially. Also, decreasing the time, the amount of use energy will decrease substantially. Uh, I could tell you that the amount of used solvent is uh, with about five, uh, five fold less in the case of uh, microwave and uh, ultrasound uh, comparative with conventional thermal heating. Also, we notice that the yields are higher under microwave and ultrasound and uh, also uh, the, selective, uh, the selectivity of reaction, it is affected by ultrasound and um, uh, microwave. And, but uh, this is dependent about the structure. This was, was uh, happening only in the two uh, uh, hydroxy derivatives, two, three, two, four, two, five, as I mentioned here in this uh, picture. So we could say that this reaction under ultrasound and microwave are environmentally friendly. If you are going, uh, if you are moving further to the bromuration and quaternization, what we could notice first. Let's talk about the bromuration. We did the bromuration in um, inter in, in catalysis, uh, interphasic catalysis using uh, copper bromide. And as you could see here, under conventional thermal heating, again, the reaction time is high. The yields are good to moderate. When we perform this reaction under ultrasound, the time decreased substantially. The yields was better. But under microwave, it was surprisingly that we did not get uh, our components uh, in the bromuration reaction. In the case of quaternization, the things are uh, roughly the same. Uh, the reaction time is very high. The yields are moderate, while uh, under microwave and ultrasound, the yields are better and the reaction time decreased dramatically for the enalkylation reaction. So, Again, we could say that uh, this reaction uh, could be considered under microwave and ultrasound uh, environmentally friendly reaction. Now I will come back to this specifically uh, structure. So this uh, dihydroxyacetophenone having in the two position the hydroxy moiety. Why? Because here it was a very interesting uh, and um, uh, very nice um, way of uh, how reaction occur. So under conventional thermal heating, it was possible to get the, uh, the uh, bis-alkylated uh, bis uh, uh, O-alkylated compound. And we get only trace about this uh, monoalkylated and we notice that there is something fluorescent inside of uh, the system. So we was quite happy about this. We was not happy about the long time of reaction as, as previously I told. When we jump to using a microwave and ultrasound, we notice that it uh, was happening in the compounds having a two hydroxy in this two position uh, of a phenyl ring, uh, something interesting. Uh, the situation was changing and it switched from the bus, uh, bisalkylating to monoalkylating um, uh, the reaction. So instead to obtain the bisalkylating, we obtaining the, we obtain it the monoalkylated. Uh, derivative and in a yield from 50 to 90. And some traces about this. This thermal heating, the first one, when we get the compounds, uh, the bisalkylated, as you could see here, it was um, conducted at uh, 85 degrees Celsius. And we get this compound, bisalkylated. So having in view that the selectivity was not good and we obtained these two as traces, we say, okay, let's try to increase the selectivity and to get only this compound, the bisalkylated. And we increase the temperature of reaction 
to 165 degrees. And when we did that, uh, that uh, our surprise was quite high because instead of obtaining the bis O alkylated compound, we get it this uh, benzofuranic system, uh, which is a fluorescent uh, compound. And having in view the situation, I say, okay, let's keep the temperature around 165 degrees and to use microwave and um, ultrasound irradiation. So what we noticed, when we used microwave irradiation and we use a reaction time of two or three hour, we get a mixture of fluorescent benzofuran this one that usually are, are uh, obtained because it is a cyclocondensation here between this CH2 and this uh, CO group. And another one, uh, another benzofuran that it is obtaining from this one by decarboxylation. And because we were still not happy to have two compounds uh, and we wish uh, a better selectivity to get only one, we increase the time of reaction, and indeed, uh, via a decarboxylation, we obtain it only one compound. So, altogether, if you are studying this big picture under thermal conventional heating, under ultrasound, uh, ultrasound or microwave radiation, in the O alkylation of this two, four, five, six dehydroxyacetophenone, we may uh, notice something that under ultrasound and mi uh, microwave uh, irradiation, the reaction could be conducted selective, obtaining this compound monoalkylated. Under microwave irradiation, again, we could modify the selectivity and to get this fluorescent compounds, as I write it here, I depict it here. Moreover, we could. Uh, according with the time we use it, we could get only one component, namely this one without uh, a steric group from here. Again, it was uh, uh, decreasing in reaction time and uh, also decreasing of energy and under microwave radiation, the amount of solvent was less. So the reaction are environmentally friendly again, and we notice that microwave radiation could induce in this reaction pathway uh, the property to obtain new chemical entities, otherwise extremely difficult to be obtained. So this benzofuranic, this fluorescence benzofuranic uh, compounds. So we move it then further to <coughs> another type of an alkylation process because we was interested to introduce here to this nitrogen um, an alkylic chain. And in this respect, we did two types of reaction. Alkylation with this uh, alpha bromo uh, uh, esters, alpha bromo esters, and with this um, chloro derivatives in, in which uh, this alkylic chain, it's um, an, uh, ethyl, uh, an um, alkenic uh, double bond or uh, alkenic triple bond. And because both type of compounds are uh, interesting from applications point of view. So what we could notice that when we did the, the reaction under conventional time, uh, thermal heating, the time was quite high from 24 to 48 hour until on 62 hours. And when we jump under ultrasound irradiation, the reaction time decreased to minutes, 65 minutes, 60 to 90 minutes in some cases. Uh, no, 10 to uh, five minutes uh, according with the uh, compound that we use it to alkylation. These are the yields that I was talking. So the reaction time decreased from two days roughly to five minutes or to 10 minutes, which is quite a good achievement. 
Also, we may notice if you compare the yields in this two type of reaction. So that means the um, uh, alkylation uses the bromine derivatives. Uh, you could notice that the yields are quite good, better than this one under conventional uh, 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 thermal heating. They are two or three times more, much higher comparative with conventional thermal heating. Also, in the reaction, we noticed that the, under ultrasound irradiation, uh, the amount of used solvent is three to five fold less. So we could say again that for uh, this type of uh, N alkylation, uh, the reaction are also environmentally friendly. We move it then to another type of heterocycle. Uh, that means uh, the five member ring as a heterocycles. And here we have a particular type of N alkylation, call it Michael addition, because uh, it is used at an alkene derivative uh, for alkylation process. And we study uh, the reaction under conventional thermal heating and also under ultrasound irradiation. What you could notice that the reaction time uh, from uh, in the case of conventional thermal heating is about 20 to 35 hours, while under ultrasound uh, only two hours. The yields are uh, comparable for one type of compounds, uh, I am talking the imidazolic system, but in the case of benzimidazole, uh, we have had a surprise under ultrasound irradiation, the reaction doesn't took place. Anyhow, what we could say that again, the reaction are environmentally friendly under ultrasound, but we notice a different reaction pathway according with the base heterocycle, if it is imidazole simple or benz imidazole system. Then we studied the esterification process. And here we was um, uh, preoccupied by esterification of uh, diols, uh, diols in one, two, one, three, and one, four position, and also with different haloacyl chloride having uh, and the alkylic chain with different levels from uh, methyl to ethyl to propyl. As you could see, uh, this N is one, two, or three. So we study basically nine type of reactions and we study this reaction under conventional thermal heating and also under microwave. But in this case, we decide to study it not only in liquid phase, we decide to study it also in solid phase. And what we could notice, under conventional thermal heating, the reaction time is again um, quite high from uh, 17 hour to uh, 53 hour, 58 hours, uh, and the year are moderate to good. If you jump, to microwave, we could notice that the reaction time decreased to five minutes and the yields was better with uh, roughly uh, 20%. When we move to do the reaction in solid phase, because in solid phase, you use no solvent, which is a good asset from a uh, green chemistry point of view. And when we perform this reaction under conventional thermal heating, no matter the condition we employ it, we obtain it only trace, uh, trace of compound. In the case of, in the case of microwave irradiation, uh, the situation was completely different. We realized to obtain the compounds in a quite moderate yield, around 40 to 50%, and in a good reaction time, five minutes. So again, we could say that uh, this type of reaction under microwave could be considered as envir environmentally friendly reaction, but with different uh, uh, reaction pathway according with the phase you are working for, you are working in. In liquid phase, the yields are higher, while in solid phase, the yields was lesser. But however, uh, both could be used in 
this sort of reaction, both uh, phases, liquid phase or solid phase under microwave. Then we move it to uh, another uh, sort of uh, esterification. The esterification reactions of uh, free four diols with uh, aromatic uh, uh, acyl chloride, uh, bis aromatic uh, acyl chloride in uh, ortho meta ampara position. We was interested actually to get these coronants of this type. But here we have had also a surprise uh, when we perform the reaction under ultrasound irradiation. In, when the, the uh, acyl chloride groups are in meta and para position, we get the coronant here that we was planning to obtain it. And as you could see here, it is the A and B. Under conventional the, the thermal heating, the reaction time was quite high and the yield was really very low. When we move to ultrasound, the reaction time decreased dramatically and the yield was better. Uh, don't look too uh, um, uh, nasty to this yield of 20% uh, uh, because in the um, uh, area of coronants, these yields are, are quite acceptable. But when we moved to this uh, uh, bis-acyl chloride in ortho position, we have had a surprise. So according with the uh, source of energy that we uh, obtain it, we use it, we get either this um, coronant of this type when you use conventional thermal heating, but when you jump to ultrasound, we get this spiroheterocycle derivatives which is quite a very nice and interesting uh, new class of compounds that uh, could have um, a lot of application, especially in asymmetric catalysis as literature described. So according with the source of energy and the um, structure of the uh, uh, bis acyl chloride, this reaction uh, could be considered environmentally friendly and ultrasound uh, have the advantage that are leading to a new type of chemical entities, this spiro heterocycle compounds. We move then to another type of um, reaction that we have uh, had to study. I'm talking about cycloaddition reaction. In cycloaddition reaction, we use it the elite chemistry, this one free dipole, and we use different dipolarophils with triple bond or with double bond, uh, non-symmetrically or symmetrically, as you could see here. And we use also thermal heating, microwave, and ultrasound irradiation. And for instance, in the case of these phthalazinic derivatives, what we could notice that under conventional thermal heating, the cycloaddition reaction occurs uh, in a very long time, 360 minutes to one week. And the, uh, the yields was uh, moderate. When we jump to ultrasound or to microwave, the reaction time decreased to 20 or to 10 minutes and the yields was much better. Again, the amount of used solvent uh, was less and uh, again, the conclusion is that this reaction of cycloadditions to a phthalazinic system are environmentally friendly. We was also interested to get these polycyclic aromatic compounds with as a heterocycle uh, skeleton using this uh, quinonic system uh, mostly this double bone from the quinonic system. And what we notice that uh, when we studied the, the um, uh, reaction pathway under conventional thermal heating, microwave and ultrasound, uh, the behavior of reaction is different. Again, we may, we may notice that the reaction uh, time decrease substantially uh, uh, in the case of microwave and ultrasound. And what we notice in the case of ultrasound, 
that according with the power of the reactors we employed, 130 uh, watts, respectively 200 watts, the reactions occur differently uh, in terms of reaction time and in terms of yields. The best way is to use a, a reactor of 200 watts that reduce the time dramatically to one minute to six minutes and the yields are much higher. So again, under microwave and especially under ultrasound irradiation of 200 watts, this reaction could be considered environmentally friendly. Uh, I wish to mention this time that we study different power of reaction. Here you see 130 and 200. The next one is 500. But to 500 watts, uh, uh, already uh, the compound, the um, uh, starting material decompose, uh, decompose, and you do not, don't get uh, uh, the, re the, the right products. So the power of the reactors under ultrasound should be uh, under 200 watts, 200 or under 200. So it is important the instrument to use it. The same in the case of microwave. Here, the results that I presented are uh, on atmospheric pressure. But we also use it uh, microwave system, the Anton Parr microwave system that are working uh, of low pressure, and there we get better results than in the um, in the case of normal pressure. But uh, I will not get into detail to don't bore you too much here. Another cycloaddition reaction uh, that was studied by us it was this free plus free cycloaddition because this one are uh, that I talked it until now it was free plus two because they are these two atoms and these three atoms involved. Here it was three plus three. These three are working with another molecules and giving this rather complicated structures, uh, call it dimer. And we study because this is the nightmare of uh, nightmare of uh, the people that are working in the area of cycloimmunio elites. These are undesirable uh, product, and we was trying to get rid of them, but in the same time to find them an application. And in order to find them an application, you have to obtain it in a very good yield. And we realized that this, we studied the reaction in liquid phase and also in solid phase. And we do uh, comparison microwave versus conventional uh, uh, thermal heating. We studied also in interphasic transfer catalysis, all the type of cycloadditions. But in interphasic uh, transfer catalysis, the reaction doesn't work properly. Only traces of compound, uh, compounds um, are uh, obtain it, and uh, we furnish uh, explanation for this. I will not get in uh, right now. So what we notice in this sort of reaction that under microwave in liquid phase, the reaction time decrease and the yields are almost double. If we move in solid phase, we may notice that under conventional uh, thermal heating, the reaction time is uh, very long and uh, the yields of reactions are not good at all. Only traces of compound was obtained. But surprisingly, when we move to microwave in solid phase, we realized to obtain our compounds in a high yield, uh, around 80 to uh, 90% and in a rather low time of 50 minutes. So we may say that in the case of Free plus free cycloaddition. Free plus free cycloaddition. Uh, it is uh, desirable to work in a solvent-free con uh, condition in solid state, and uh, uh, the reaction um, uh, occur very smoothly with a remarkable acceleration for reaction. You notice that uh, the time is about fifteen minutes. Uh, so consequently, the consumed energy decreased considerably. Uh, 
And uh, what it is important also from ecological point of view, from, from, from the green chemistry, that in this case, we use no solvent. It's a solvent-free reaction. So for sure, again, this reaction are environmentally friendly. And um, here, uh, I wish to present to some of our results. Uh, it, it, there will be the last slides that I have it. I prepared it for today, so uh, uh, a little bit patient. Um, in this case, I will present to some of our results in the area of other steroids analogs. And here we were studying again the alkylation, but I will present you for today only the results that you have it under uh, cycloaddition reaction, the fruit plus two cycloaddition. You notice that we get these eyelids from here, and we study in the cycloaddition reaction with this triple bond, uh, non symmetrical dip dipolarophil or this symmetrical dipolarophil, when we get the desired compounds. So, what we notice here that under ultrasound irradiation, the reaction time decreased for 48 hours to two hours, and the yields was higher in some cases. In some cases, not, if you are looking here to this, uh, uh, in this table. Uh, anyhow, also the uh, energy decrease in the case, uh, the amount of used energy decrease in the uh, case of uh, ultrasound using and the amount of used it, uh, use it solvent decrease with uh, uh, five uh, orders. So the, this reaction could be considered environmentally friendly. And the last reaction that I wish to show you is this one. And I consider that it's quite interesting. And uh, this is why I uh, will put you in your attention. We are interested to get compounds having in the same molecules, uh, six member ring as a heterocycle, rich, uh, uh, deficient are um, uh, in electron and a uh, five member ring, which is rich in electron, uh, and they are connected via different linker. Here I presented for this one with only a CH2 group and this amide group. And we did the reaction with different uh, reagent and we get this first class of compounds. And then we studied the cycloaddition reaction of this cycloimmunoid elites that I presented here. You have here the dipole with this uh, acetylene decarboxylate um, derivative <coughs> with triple bone. And we study both under thermal heating and ultrasound irradiation, and also using different solvents mm -hmm. from um, organic solvents, uh, typical uh, as it is uh, ethanol, uh, as it is chlor uh, methylene chloride, uh, to uh, this uh, epoxy uh, butan uh, derivative. And you will uh, see why we choose this uh, epoxy, epoxy, uh, um, ethyl, epoxy but, uh, butane uh, derivative or ethyloxyrane, if you wish. So when we use free ethyl amine in this sort of reaction, we get under conventional thermal heating, nothing. We were supposed to obtain these compounds from the, from the uh, left side, this one with uh, imidazolic system as this one and this one. But under conventional thermal heating and free ethylamine use it as catalyst, we don't get anything. When we use ultrasound in the uh, three ethylamine uh, amine conditions, we get a mixture of these three types of compounds. To this one, we expect it to this imidazolics because it, this is a typical three plus two cycle addition. But to this one, this um, one four diazinic system, we did not expect it. And this was a new class of uh, compounds that could be obtained through this uh, sort of reaction under ultrasound irradiation. The point is that uh, when we use a free ethylamine, the yields in this compound are quite low. And of course, it is a mixture of these free compounds and it is quite difficult to separate it. We realized to separate it, but uh, we was not happy about this. Uh, 
So we change the conditions. And we use, in this case, we choose the solvent. We choose this non-toxic solvent, this epoxy butan that I presented here. And we did the reaction in two ways, under uh, ultrasound or conventional thermal heating, and also under ultrasound or conventional uh, thermal heating, but using a catalyst. And what we get, when we use it, uh, this condition without a catalyst, we get a mixture of this um, pyroloimidazolic system, uh, fully aromatize it or partially aromatize it, but anyhow with good yields. And when we got, when we introduced the, a catalyst, we realized to obtain only one compound, uh, this one, which is fully aromatized it, and also with good yield, as you could see here. So what we may notice that under conventional thermal heating, the uh, time of reaction decreased substantially. Uh, in order to obtain the best yields and also the compounds that we wish it, it is better to use a non-toxic solvent as it is epoxy butane. And uh, also we discover a selective pathway in order to obtain only one type of compound, either this one with pyroloimidazolic system or either uh, the others that I presented previously. So this reaction are also environmentally friendly. So are microwave and ultrasound environmentally friendly methods in organic chemistry? Our answer is yes, because from the 12th from the uh, 12, uh, that uh, 12 principle of green chemistry, uh, our um, uh, reaction under microwave and ultrasound fulfills at least eight of them. So the reactions, uh, the use of microwave and ultrasound in uh, organic chemistry are safer matter, comparative with thermal heating and environmentally friendly. Here you have some selective uh, five. You I presented uh, uh, five selective publication from the last five years, uh, but we have a lot. We have about uh, more than fifty publication uh, concerning the influence of microwave and ultrasound in um, heterocycle chemistry. And here it is my team. We, uh, there are two professors, one associate professor, three lecturers, some uh, doctors and uh, my colleagues which are performing NMR and X-ray. And I wish to thank you for your attention. I start this, uh, this new research line in my laboratory. Uh, we, we, we were born as uh, analytical chemistry group. Uh, you see this is the upcoming web address of our group is just uh, uh, building in, during these uh, these hours, uh, this uh, this new this our website, and uh, we 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 were born uh, as uh, a chromatographer, like a chromatography, mass chromatography, HPLC, GC, and so on. And this is the first time that we we deal uh, the discovering this particular coupling with the electrochemical detection. Uh, for us, it's very, it's very strange. It's very, it's very difficult. It's very, it's, it's different. It's very difficult. We, we have not too much experience with the electrochemical detection, but we, we would like to to grow up because this uh, we we believe that this uh, this coupling is really important in these two fields. I mean the environmental fields and the food science. In these two fields, this, uh, this coupling is, uh, could be play, uh, could play uh, an important role. And uh, this is confirmed also by the, uh, uh, the growing uh, uh, increase, the, the increasing papers published in this, uh, in this field, in this, in this coupling. Until 20 years ago, very few papers. During these two last decades, uh, out of papers coming out, on this uh, on the, on this topic so my presentation will be a uh, briefly of course review on this uh, on this technique on this coupling 
we we will start from the base uh, basic uh, um, argument about the electrochemical detection. What is a chemical sensor? Uh, what is the chemical the, the the chemical sensor classification? And after we 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 get the discovering how is uh, how can how we can do discovering and what the main papers published in the in, in this field we 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 have divided this uh, this field in uh, according to different uh, food cereal meat oil fruits beverage honey which which is very important aromatic plants and after we focused our attention on a particular compound that will play an important role worldwide in the um, food science, the, glyphos the glyphosate. This is a, a very uh, important, uh, with uh, different toxic uh, problems, and this is really important. In all these fields, we can see that the discovering play an important role, plays an important role and uh, um, the main problem for the HPLC detection in regards, of course, the, the, the detection, we see that the detectors play an important role. We can have different detection, of course. We have the uh, ultraviolet, ultra, ultraviolet visible. We have mass detection. We have the, the fluorescence and so on. We can see me. Okay, and uh, we, we have different different detection with different limit of detection and limit of quantification. This uh, discovering with the electrochemical detection maybe uh, can can increase this uh, this sensitivity, the accuracy and the precision of the measurements, and we can have a very interesting loads and, uh, and logs. So it uh, it seems a good idea. To have this, uh, this, uh, this electrochemical detection, we can see on the right side of this slide the good sensitivity, high selectivity, depending on the on uh, what kind of electrode we are, we are going to consider. Direct analysis, we can have uh, the batch, batch analysis, but especially the flow injection analysis, the FIE. A. So it means uh, we can have different solution for achieving our, uh, our results. It's an expensive technique. How can it cost a sensor? We can do homemade, we can do, uh, we, we can buy just, uh, just done. We can, uh, we can have different uh, sensor in this, in this situation. Of course, the, mm, there is some advice, some disadvantages about this. I mean, of course, we have to uh, to rebuild the, the for, for example the calibration curve every time we have a new a new a new um, system and a new sensor and so on. Uh, it depends on different analytical parameters where we have to check every time. But in any in any case, it can be. A, a good solution for solving some problems. The, <coughs> the, main, the main thing is um, basically is to have a, a, a curve, a, um, sigmoid, a sigmoidal curves. It means a, a intensity, of, um, intensity against the, the potential is called the hydrodynamic voltammograms, uh, where we, we we can find out the main um, the, the main characteristics the, 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 the main characteristics of that of that compounds. So we have to put in the main in the in the uh, working potential in the main point working potential to get the, the high sensitivity and selectivity. You can see that uh, uh, no many papers can can uh, came out during this uh, this period uh, to 250 publication between 19, 1982 and 2021 uh, 2021 um, if we can uh, uh, check the different uh, uh, keywords, HPLC, ED, 
food and the environment, we see that we have more than 20 papers and this, this, this number is increasing year by year, especially during these recent, recent years. So we believe that it is not possible to, uh, to, um, to, have, to, to, um, to not to consider these, these techniques. What is a chemical sensor? Because uh, we, 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 we know very well what is the HPLC, what uh, it, uh, it works. Mm, sometimes it's not so uh, common to use uh, a chemical sensors. We have different uh, um, definition about this. We believe that this uh, definition by Wolbis in 1990, which is, could be considered the best. It means uh, uh, chemical sensor is a miniaturized device is capable, capable of continuously and reversibly providing the measurement of a chemical concentration by means of a recognition element, a transducer and a signal processor. It means uh, it's a very easy, easy instrument. This is the, the main goal. This is the, the large advantage of this, of this, of this detection systems. It's very, it's very easy. You can see in this, in this slide, we have the receptor. It can be different, but it can be inorganic, organic, biological receptor. A transducer, it means it is able to transform, to, to, um, yeah, yeah, to transform, um, to transport a signal to a, an electronic system and after to a, a PC. Receptor, you see that uh, is a site in which the chemical reaction <laughs> gives rise to a form of energy that can be measured by, by a transducer. It means in, in, in so substantially we have the transformation of this, uh, this signal of this uh, uh, signal by a receptor in a signal can be read by a by a computer. Um, as just said before, in terms of sensitivity and selectivity. Um, electrochemical detection has not uh, uh, many um, many uh, competitors. Um, optical detector, uh, aerosol-based detector, uh, light scattering, and so on cannot comp compete with the electrochemical detection in terms of uh, sensitivity and selectivity. So they are very um, they, are, they can reach very low level of detection. Um, how can we can classify this, um, this sensor? The classification can be, you see, can, can be done by different, uh, in different way. Can, we, can consider, we can consider about the measurement. So different types of measurements, voltammetry, amperometry, electrochemical impedance. Otherwise, we can consider the different signal or the different kind of analysis. So we have different classification. Um, each, each one could be considered, could, can, can be considered uh, valid. Again, each one can be uh, used for, for, this, um, for, this, um, for our scope. Basically, we divided the, 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 the sense of classification in, in four different types. The first one is potentiometric sensors. So in this case, we have uh, preferred to divide the, the, the sensor uh, based on their uh, kind, the, the, their uh, um, parameters we are going to measure. In this case, the potentiometric sensors. Um, historically, um, potentiometric sensors were, were was uh, uh, related to the classic galvanic cell. In this case, uh, the, the system is, of course, is really uh, miniaturized, and we have uh, the small and large scale instruments. Uh, the difference is purely uh, geometric. Uh, and, uh, nowadays, the best potentiometric sensors are ion selective electrodes or the classical uh, glass electrode for other measurements. We have uh, seen the 
different um, cam fat uh, MOSFET uh, sensor, uh, the, the silver electrode, the, the alumina substrate, um, where there is uh, uh, basic the, the, the electrode, and so, and so on. Um, the second kind of electrode is the amperometric, amperometric sensors. In this case, uh, um, among the different sensors, the amperometrics, amperometric are not inherently selective. Um, any, any kind of uh, species can be, uh, have, uh, can be, can, uh, can be active, can be that can be detected in this way, um, basically for increasing uh, the, um, the measurement with the amperometric sensor, we, the authors can use a filtering on the ion of flux. Um, there is a, in this way, there is a contact between the electrode surface and the uh, membrane and the, and the, and the compound. Um, we have the complete, the complete polarization. We have an ion of flu flux filtration. This is what I, I, just, uh, I just said. And um, this is a, a specific uh, amperometric sensor for uh, a um, flow injection for measurement in, in flow injection analysis. This is a colometric, a colometric sensor. Uh, it's uh, an electrolytical technique based on the measurement of the electrical charge uh, necessary for the complete uh, conversion uh, of the analyte. We have, uh, uh, you see the reference electrode, the encounter electrode, uh, the working electrode give us the, 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 um, the, the, the parameter we are going in, we are, we are measuring um, different, uh, different. Uh, of course, uh, there is uh, about the, 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 the three system and the fourth is uh, the fourth is the biosensor has the different advantages, advantages, disadvantages according to uh, the, the compound that we are going to, to measure and then also uh, as well as the matrices we are going to, uh, to, to analyze. The fourth uh, uh, classification, the fourth sensors uh, are the uh, biosensors. Um, biosensors are very, uh, are, uh, it's not, a, it's not uh, a, a new, a new device is well, well done, is well studied, well in the, they are well investigated, um, different types of uh, of receptors uh, in this uh, in this uh, um, the biosensor is a combination of a um, bio um, a sensor a electrochemical sensor and a biological a biological system in the, at the beginning uh, this the biosensor was called the bioselective sensor for this uh, um, for this uh, for this reason um, the electrochemical biosensor are a class of a biosensor that function using an electrochemical transducer, different transducer, different kind of, of sensors. In this, in, this, in this moment, for example, the molecular imprinted the polymers, uh, M, MIP, S, are, uh, are really important for measuring different kind of uh, organic uh, compounds, especially, for example, the toxins. Uh, they are very specific, they are very selective, and in this case, uh, the, uh, the sensitivity is really, is really high because they are selective. So for concluding this, uh, this, uh, this um, first, uh, first part, this is uh, the, we, we have the, uh, the coupling between our HPLC system, classic PC system, column, gar column, HPLC column, or whatever we, 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 we need, the injection, the injection, the, the injection system, of course, and after we have the uh, electrochemical detection. This electrochemical detection is different, can be, can be different, of, of course, the profile 
the layout according to the to the uh, detection we are going to consider. But this is uh, basically the, um, the, the the profile, the layout. Very, very easy, but very effective from another point of view. Uh, so, um, starting from the uh, our our um, um, matrices, we can say when the, the different uh, um, analyzed substances in different uh, um, products. Then we start with the uh, cereal, rice, and wet. Different, different, different um, matrices, but the same. Uh, we can say the same, the same type. Different, of course, different uh, papers. We uh, concentrated. Uh, we talk, we we focused our attention on some. So on few papers, of course. Because uh, the, um, the you can say the mechanism, the mechanism, the action, the the, the papers are still um, quite similar between among among them. The first thing is to, to set up uh, the uh, elution. What is the best elution? What is the best column to have the, the a good uh, a good elution, a good separation? Uh, further, we have to, to check what is the uh, hydronomic um, voltammograms, what, what I, I said at the beginning, because we have to, to check the uh, potential working, what is the, what is the maximum um, potential where we have the oxidation or reduction of the uh, investigated the compounds, and after we have the dilution. This is the, 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 the scheme of, uh, an, uh, of, of, such, of such studies. Uh, all these studies are, uh, um, are performed according to this, to, this, to this procedure, to this master scheme. Three different, pro three different profiles, three different papers in this case. In the first paper by Visconti et al, uh, they, they are analyzed the alter, alter toxins, uh, some, some kind of different toxins in a fungus. This fungus is alternaria alternata. In this case, they, they, they did not use, the, they did not use a, a gradient elution, but just an isocratic elution. And they, they analyze with the um, dual serial electrode det detection dual in series electro de electros detections. Um, they reached a very interesting, very interesting uh, LOD limit of detection. We are talking about sub PPM levels, 30, 30 picograms with a very good RSD around and below 60%. So they, they reach a very high uh, performance of uh, their, their system. And we, we worked in the redox, um, in the redox uh, um, mode. It means the, uh, the electrode was, uh, the indicator electrode was uh, set up at minus 0 0.1 volt, whereas the generated electrode were, were, was uh, at 1.0 volt. And uh, um, another paper was in 2001 was by Noe et al. According to for determining the nitrophenols, the nonifenols, pardon me, in in uh, in rice, in cooked rice. Or they, in this case, they used the, the columetic electrode array detection, and they determined that the um, potential working at the 60, 60 um, 70 millivolt for the for the potential working. We plug and the tal instead they studied the, the citrin, this, this particular compound in um, in, in weight. This slide, the next slide, reported all the I'm sorry, all the parametri analytical parameters determined by by the by the author uh, and then the, the, the main uh, 
um, parameters. This is the, the, the most important column, which is the potential working for the uh, for the potential for of the uh, working electrode. Um, meat and fish are two different matrices where, where the HPLC illusion is largely applied. Basically, this, uh, this detection is made of uh, um, UV detection or mass spectrometry. But there are some papers um, reporting this determination the, the with the electrochemical detection. We just focused oh. our attention on four different kind of compound, tyramine, ortho and meta tyrosine, electro, electro heterocyclic aromatic amines that are very important from the um, toxicological point of view. Uh, heterocyclic aromatic amines are considered probable carcinogens uh, group 2A or 2B, so they are very important from this point, point of view. And, and in, at the end, the rosmarinic acid, which is, uh, which is uh, uh, like uh, a phenolic uh, compound, like a phenolic compound uh, you use the, with the electrocolumetic columetic detection with different kind of the detector uh, positioned, located in dif at different, at different uh, potential, potential uh, um, of working electrons. Uh, this is the different, the different uh, matrix, the different analyte considered, the column and the uh, limit of detection reached. We see nanograms to so grams, ppb, uh, picograms to so microliters, so, so very low limit of detection with very good recoveries and very low uh, relative standard deviation, minus 4%. Very good uh, avoiding different uh, complex uh, system extraction procedures of of extraction that they are necessary with the uh, HPLC mass spectrometry or UV detection. Uh, oils, seed, and vegetables are, mat man are other different uh, matrices where um, the only the electrative compound can be, can be measured. This is not easy in, in this case. Maybe you see an example, butter, palm oils are very uh, margarine, virgin olive oil, olive oils, very difficult, very difficult compounds. But in this case, you are different, uh, the different papers dealing with this, uh, this determination. You, they use the, the HPLC electrochemical detection um, better than the ultraviolet detection. In this paper, uh, the different authors uh, established a comparison between the AED and the UV detections, and they found out that the HPLC ED detection is better than UV. It means they, it reaches a lower, uh, lower uh, LOD with high uh, sensitivity in this case. Um, another, another, another interesting determination regards the strobilurin uh, in, in, uh, in beans. This, uh, this fungi, fungicides uh, is, 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 is interesting and um, is a group of natural products and uh, uh, with a long half life, uh, the, the authors developed an uh, analytical method based on a boron doped diamond electrode with antero amperometric detection. The amperometric detection are not so common in this case, but this is uh, an important application. We reach the very low uh, limit of detection, micrograms for, uh, per, per kilograms, and uh, it is an important from this point of view with an NRSD mean below 9, 9% and recovery around 60 to 95% uh, of, of, of the different compounds. Another, another classes of compounds of matrices where the uh, electrochemical detection is used for determining nutritional compounds 
is fruit and fruit juice, especially fruit juice. We see uh, different papers. So one, this is related to, to strawberries, this orange juice, and this apple fruit, especially this, this last one, uh, fluoridine glycoside, is used for detection, the um, alteration, the adulteration of a, uh, a fruit juice. Uh, very, very important because we avoid, we can avoid uh, all the pre, pre, pre extraction procedure or the uh, analytical procedures for determining such compounds. Also in this case, the, uh, the limit of detection and the, the, the reach are very, uh, are quite good in this case for the orange juice. In the other case, we have no information about the, the, the text, but they analyze for the, um, for the first time this, this kind of, of compounds. Also the recovery in, in orange juice is very good, it's quite a quantitative determination. I'm going uh, to rush uh, for avoiding the two uh, overpass the, the time. Uh, we have the determination, we have an application of this, uh, of this uh, uh, coupling in the, in the in beverage. Of course, beverage, uh, we can imagine that beverage is the most easy and uh, um, studied the matrices with this, uh, the, the, this coupling because there is the, the, we have very low um, analytical treatment. Uh, so very common to have determination of, uh, um, uh, of different compounds in water, milk, tea, beer, wine, alcoholic drinks, brandy samples, and, and so on. We, 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 we just would like to highlight three different determinations in cow milk. Milk, we know that there is a very difficult uh, matrix uh, but considered very hard because it's strongly subject to exogenous, exogenous compounds. So this application is really important. Another important application regards the water, but um, it's not in, in, in the water is the problem. The problem is related to the compound. We are going to analyze bisphenol A, which is very important kind of, of uh, compound in this case. Our laboratory has a long story, and a long important story in determining the uh, pH, the, 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 the phthalates compounds. Also for this reason, we have added this bisphenol A. And this is the determination in water, such can, can phenolic compound in water for uh, the different kind of uh, limit of detection determined in these, uh, the different uh, matrices. We are going to rush to any uh, HPLC and decoupling is, is uh, uh, important also in the, in the honey can, the honey determination with different phenolic compounds or an insecticide Tiametosan receives in, in honey by cholerae detection. In aromatic plants, we can see that if this is really important, just, just, just one moment on this, on this slide, and then we, we, we rush. We have the different, uh, for different compound, vanilla, neogen, or carbachlor, etymol. We have different load and lock according to UV, amperometric, colometric detection. We see that this detection is still decrease. And uh, with columetic, we have to reach these nanograms, of course, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't say this. And uh, this is nanograms as very low detection by the columetic detection. Um, particular compound is the glyphosate. The glyphosate is in this, uh, in this metabolite AMP. Um, this is the, con the, the determination in tomato juice, fruit juice, and the water. We see the very low detection limit that they are capable to determine according to the, to the rule. So what is the conclusion? High sensitivity for the electrochemical detection, even if this is not so, uh, so um, used the worldwide. Less matrix interference. Of course, they are very, they, they are very selective. Min minimization of the sample preparation and cleanup procedures, numerous analysis in succession, and the cost effectiveness of this orientation are very, very low. Thank you very much for your kind attention. And once again, thank you very much for the invitation. Okay. First of all, I would like to say 
it's watery, mysterious substance. It is a compound, apparently very simple, but it can form very interesting, very interesting structures. And uh, you see the example, perhaps most of you know it already, but just in order to be 100% clear, i beginning with this picture. The red balls are oxygen from water molecules. White balls, small balls are hydrogen atoms. And inside and these uh, molecules, these 20 molecules of water form a kind of cavity, which inside can accommodate different chemical species. One of those is methane, CH4. And they, so, and it is bonded quite strongly inside and is bonded as long as this cavity is stable. This cavity is a sort of, this compound is a sort of snow or ice, if you like. It melts at slightly higher temperature than the ordinary ice. It's, it depends on the conditions. So uh, if we melt, the structure, if we decompose the structure, methane goes out. But as long as the structure is stable, it sits there. <clears throat> few, uh, few sentences about the history. This, this title is perhaps a little bit wrong. It was not 60, but 70 years ago already. And you see on the, on the picture, something which is very strange. It was, the picture was taken somewhere in Siberia and published in the uh, Russian daily newspaper a long time ago. And then was just copied and reproduced it by Bakogon and his uh, interesting paper in La uh, many years later. What you see, please, uh, have a look at the bottom of this of this picture. You see big Siberian uh, pine trees, these are, which are, look very small compared to this very big giant icicle. What happened? They were drilling for oil or gas. I don't know which one. And very early during drilling through shallow permafrost part, they suddenly big outflow of water happened. Uh, there was no chemical explosion, just simply water flowing out of this the drilling place. And of course, since uh, outside temperature at that time was very, very, very low, Reportedly, it was minus 63 degrees centigrade. So this water was frozen outside and formed this giant icicle. Well, uh, Russian scientists, of course, quickly discovered what was the reason. And the reason was just uh, methane, which was frozen in the form of this cavity compound in permafrost and during the heat of drilling uh, melted this and the water uh, flew, flew out. So <clears throat> this was something interesting, also important because it happened many times in different places in Siberia during drilling, but knowing when the phenomenon, it was under control, typically there was no, there, there were no problems. But I will show you some another example, which already points, you know, the extreme importance of this phenomenon. This is a, a American satellite picture from 1960s or 60s or so from Arctic uh, Sea, this part, you see Bennett Island and uh, 
What is important? You see this banana shaped white field, this one. It is 130 kilometers long and about 30 kilometers wide. And it was, according to uh, invest American invest satellite investigations, it was methane, enormous amount of methane. The reason and the secret was that in this part of in this part of uh, sorry, uh, in in this part of the world, some uh, in Soviet times in the nineteen sixties many uh, nuclear tests were performed and the the one which i mark here with this blue star not exactly this place where you of course don't know where exactly it, it exploded somewhere not far from here and it was the so-called king of bombs the 50 megaton uh, hydrogen bomb and as you know ocean under such an explosion boils and when it boils then if there is methane in the form of clusters of course it melts and this is the reason why so huge amount of methane appeared <clears throat> um, well i'm not sure if you can uh, clearly see the, this, this picture here, this diagram. How full is it? This is a uh, ocean surface. And this is the temperature, temperature of water. When you go down to at about at about 500, 500 meters below the sea level, this line, this temperature, crosses the uh, area of stability of methane clutterate. So if there is a source of methane, of course water is there, so there are perfect conditions, perfect conditions for methane clutterate to form. These data are taken from the US Geological uh, Service uh, publications. Uh, I frankly have taken it from German popular journal Spectrum der Wissenschaften, which published, published these beautiful pictures. Also the picture of this, uh, uh, this boat. Uh, for, for scientific investigation. This is a sample of, uh, of uh, snow, methane snow taken from, uh, uh, from the bottom. And uh, please have a look where such deposits were found in the, on, on Earth. Practically over where, mostly on ocean shelves, but also on Baikal Lake, Caspian Sea, everywhere where, you don't know, the depth is enough, about 500 meters, and there's source of methane. Now, <clears throat> I have to make a short comment because these data taken from US Geological Survey, they are now already about 25 years old. So what I will say in a second is 25 years old, very pessimistic, because uh, fortunately later I will make it a uh, little less pessimistic than now. This black part is the amount of on Earth, it's globally on Earth, the amount of 
organic, so-called organic carbon in the form of methane. And you see, you can see it's much more than all other soil, oil, gas, coal, uh, biosphere, all this is less than just C, uh, CH, CH4. If it is so, then you can, you can imagine that slightly heating up the ocean at this depth of 500 meters, not much is needed, one, two degrees is enough to destabilize this enormously big deposits. And it, according to these old estimates, the amount of methane uh, is of the same order of magnitude as the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere. So evolution of all this would be certainly a global catastrophe. This is the Damocles sword in the title. Uh, now I'm going to much more recent data which is uh, titled now, which is a few years uh, ago. And you see, uh, well, in the US, there are regular expeditions to study these deposits, these new, old and new deposits. And you can see some examples of it. This is one showing, showing bubbling of uh, gases methane from the bottom. Uh, this is another one. This is, this is in somewhere in, the, in Virginia. And uh, <clears throat> a short map just to show where such new sources, new deposits were found. And you can see that it is almost everywhere, perhaps not so huge amount of, of methane, but it is everywhere, almost everywhere. It's interesting to, it's interesting to make, uh, the, for chemists, it's, it's very, I have to say, interesting experience because they can take a part of the, some of this snow on hand and put fire to it. So it's, yeah, you may, you, you may have by burning, burning snow or burning ice on your on your head and on your on your hand, and it is not it is not dangerous at all. Very nice experience, and the young students appreciate it very very much indeed. So we we use it for to say propaganda to sh to show what what is the problem. <clears throat> This is a picture, quite recent, few years, few years old, picture of uh, methane snow taken already on the industrial scale uh, by Chinese. They already have uh, some uh, pilot plants for uh, exploiting these sources because of course one of the ideas is to is to use is to use this as a source of methane it's not an easy task as you may imagine but uh, it is possible there are already technologies how to how, how to make it and countries like japan which are uh, do, do not have uh, other other sources uh, work very hard on on it, and Japan is also one. One Japan and China are among the leaders in the, in this field. <clears throat> I would like to show you uh, two people here. Uh, this person is Yuri Diadin from Novosibirsk. Uh, Yuri Diadin, with. I'm sorry to say that he passed away a few years ago, and so he's not working any longer, of course, but very, 
uh, one of the world class experts in the field of water clot rates of water uh, inclusion compounds. But what is also interesting behind him here you can see Adi Manako, the co-author of this, of this presentation. <clears throat> and uh, what I would like to show you uh, also in this context is something completely different. Water, of course, may be host material to enclose methane or enclose many other compounds. I mentioned that we're working on it for a long time. And of course, I have no time to discuss it in detail. But water can be also trapped in a special chemical species like uh, metal organic frameworks or covalent organic frameworks. And what you can see here in the picture is Omar Yagi, one uh, uh, Jordanian from, from origin, but of course working uh, permanently in the United States. And what he did was to construct special metal organic framework able to entrap water molecules and very with very high affinity to it. So, for example, if you take this this material to Sahara Desert, so at night where temperature is very low, even ten or fifteen percent humidity is enough to fill these cavities with water, and then in when the the uh, morning sun starts operating on this material, this water comes out uh, because of heating. And uh, Yagi and his co-workers, they not only built chemical species high, with high affinity to water, to, to water for absorption ability to water, but also they built a special set of, of, of materials with some graphite as a compound absorbing heat from sun in the morning. So now if you use this device already ready to use, so to say, then instead of instead of um, uh, carrying a huge amount of, of, of water in your um, visiting Sahara or the other the, the deserts, you may simply take a few kilograms of this material to absorb water at night and give it back at, uh, at the day, daytime. Very interesting. So, uh, what what I would what I wanted to to say, and uh, of course, but this is the um, reference to the uh, short paper um, making a little bit propaganda about this achievement of Omar Yagi. What I would like to say is that uh, methane from one side is a very interesting source of material. Methane is, of course, uh, valuable uh, stuff for chemistry, for technology. So if you, we are able, like China and Japan, to exploit such sources, it is, it is of, high, of high values, of high value. Uh, as far as exploiting permafrost uh, places, it is already known uh, by uh, Siberian people, by, by, by Russians, it's already known for decades how to use it. And it, it's economically 
okay, some four or five percent of energy of this methane uh, accumulated in this uh, in this methane snow or ice is enough to have to say to keep the process uh, going. So for permafrost regions, no problem at all. For uh, ocean sources, uh, it's slightly more difficult, but technology technologies are already uh, uh, known and maybe may maybe used. From well, curiosities, if you if yes, you so inspect we... internet on this topic, you can find some some very intriguing uh, details like uh, on Lake, Lake Baikal is very deep so the, the, the regular expeditions to, uh, to take the samples, big samples of uh, methane ice from, uh, from this bottom. So uh, you may see a big block of of ice, uh, and uh, you you make you make a, a small hole. Methane is evolving. You burn it, and you can boil water on the piece of uh, of, of ice. So it's something funny, but uh, first we should. Uh... What is uh, the most important part is uh, the ecology hazard. As you know, methane is twenty times. Sorry, Professor. We should uh, we should uh, resume because we are almost over the time. Yeah. Well, just one uh, minute. I'm about to end. I just I just have to say. Just have to say that according to old sources from 25 years ago, the well, the evolving of all this methane to atmosphere would be would mean the complete catastrophe, ecological catastrophe. But what I need to say is that uh, according to uh, US sources, this amount is slightly less, so perhaps. The catastrophe is dramatic, as I said, as, as I said before. And what I would like to uh, to add details of it, with more detailed description, is will be given and is given in the uh, book edited by Professor Vasashta and Professor Duca. So you, you you may find all the details. In there. Thank you very much.